An error is with output. Can you give us an iCarly countdown? Uh, actually, <laughs> hold up. I got an error message. But we seem to potentially be live. Yes, we yep. are. <laughs> oh, okay. I got we have a link. Too, no? Yep. I see us. Okay. I, I, I see some chat happening. Interesting. Y'all hear us? Yeah. Hey, we are yeah. Okay. We We're got getting a lot of highs. Hello, yeah. Everyone. 20. Okay. Um, I don't know. Boy, I'm glad I didn't go off on a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'll take oh. it. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. We're fine. My yes. phone was not as silent as I thought it was. <laughs> Actually, probably. Yes. It was very, it was very unprofessional of you, Red. You know. <laughs> I know you're new to this, but yeah, doing? yeah, you know how it is. Uh, well, I know what we're doing. We're here to do the season two uh, wrap up Q and A. You know, it's the the end of the, end of the season. I'm sure y'all got questions. Uh, we got nothing better to do for the next two hours, so we're here to take questions. Uh, some folks have emailed them in to us at rollwithdifficulty at gmail dot com. <laughs> Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in chat. Just be aware that uh, we might not have time to get to everything. So if you have a pressing question that you'd like us to maybe respond to at a later time, if it doesn't make it into the Q&A stream, please feel free to email it to us over the rest of the week and we'll get around to giving you a response. Um, I'm just going to tweet out that this is live now and then uh, <laughs> we can get this, game, this party started. Yeah. I'm going to assume that the food emojis don't mean anything. No, it's that's my fault. Uh, whenever I stream <laughs> solo. I didn't do any. I didn't say anything. They're doing <laughs> potatoes all on their own. All right. All right. <laughs> I was like, if I ignore it, they'll probably stop. But then somebody. <laughs> yeah. I, have to, I have to ask. I'm, I'm curious. No, no, it's fair. It's fair. How dare you? <laughs> come, into, come into my stream like this. <laughs> <laughs> you drop potatoes. It's blasphemy is what it is. Everything is loading mm, so slowly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The they need to here. just calm down a little bit. I haven't you shall have no yet. further streams before <laughs> me. <laughs> bananas and potatoes? Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. I don't know about the bananas, but the potatoes are familiar. That's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's enough Twitter for now. Is it sent? Yeah. Well, you don't want to see everybody speculating about the new Zelda trailer or dunking on anyway, Fire Emblem? we're here. <laughs> for the season two wrap up Q&A. Focus. Uh, this will be available Never. in VOD form and also as an audio only release within a few days. I know that I'm a bit quieter than everyone else, so I will try to project. It's just the way that the mix works on Streamlabs. Uh, <laughs> and we're going to kick this thing off with uh, just a little question that someone emailed us earlier in the week. Um, will I do my bit? Uh let me just unfurl one of these many. <laughs> Why <laughs> would you? <laughs> Un unfurl is a long scroll All and it's right. a single line that says baseball question mark. I'll fly <laughs> in the outfield or something. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's just what it is. Uh, so this first question came to our email and it's, what planes would the characters like to visit or revisit the most? Hmm. Good question. Solid start. Should we go in any sort of order, no, or just whatever your heart tells you? Okay. Well, I, I mean, we ended with one of my favorite planes of existence, so I'm pretty much satisfied. Anywhere we go uh, from here uh, would be fun, but Beastlands is where it's at for me. Always Beastlands. If we can mm -hmm. go back at some point, that'd be great. But I, I, I'm pretty satisfied. Yeah, going back to to a previous plane is is pretty cool. I know there's like a a small handful that we haven't been to. Uh, Virla would like to go back to Mechanus. He's been a, away from a home that he doesn't really know it, whether or not it's his home anymore. So, <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, going back to that would be cool. I think Kiana wants to visit the Feywild again, uh, just mm -hmm. because just absolutely such fond, warm memories of the understanding the concept of family for the first time ever. Um, but I think she, she'd like be there for a week and then she'd be like, okay, back to the astral plane where things make sense. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously, I do want to go back to the Plane of Fire to go to the City of Brass at some point, because as much as we <laughs> lag on Otto, like, I, yeah. <laughs> Danny's, like, only family-adjacent thing. Trouble. But, uh, <laughs> no, I want to go to the second layer of Acheron, um, the Jockyard. Oh, God. Yes. So yes. Okay. 
That's yeah. right. Going so bad. going to a previous plane, but like a second layer. Yeah, that yeah, would be yeah, that'd yeah. be pretty cool. Yeah, that'd be fun. Mm. Ooh, that would be wanna, incredibly dope. Ooh, I want to do it. <laughs> um, I uh, you awesome. yeah you awesome. I, no definitely. Uh, first off, I do love the beast lands, and um, if anything, my the only thing, uh, not the only, but uh, I wish we got to spend more time in these planes in the on the pod. All of them I've loved so far, and I feel like there could have been so much beast land stuff. I'd love to go back, but. Which one do I, if, if I gotta pick just one, uh, we're going back to hell, baby. We gotta go back <laughs> to the nine hells. Baby, <laughs> oh, let's go. It's so fun there. It is so, yes. so fun. Um, but yeah, second layer of Acheron, I mean, it, I know about it because it interests me. So uh, obviously that's a, that's a mm -hmm. definitely cool one. Uh, but there's also a, a Pandemonium and Limbo are places yeah. we have not been. So everyone has mentioned they want to revisit, but mm -hmm. in, uh, yeah. in terms of places we haven't been, uh, the uh, ever-changing... Uh, uh, land of Limbo and uh, yes. the, the howling winds of Pandemonium. Does it count if Virla wants to say he wants to go back to Abyss? <laughs> <laughs> the Abyss would be very cool. Yeah, there is actually a city in the Abyss. It's just so you can visit there. It's just really sucky. Yeah, I know yeah. Virla saw. <laughs> well, that's I mean that's a, there's a city on the first layer that you can like oh get to kind of like um. Uh, uh, like all the port towns that you went to so far. Like with there's, tourism there's and shit? Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, yeah. Most of the cultists. Um, oh. It's a horrible bad place. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, this next question comes from the chat. Uh, Benoit Gassi. I'm so sorry if I said that wrong. Uh, something that they think they just keep mishearing. What is the name of the boss of the chef's guild? Uh, they keep hearing current Metro <laughs> City. Austin, what is, what is that guy's name? Uh, all right. Yeah, I think, I think is... a better question is, Austin, what the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah fuck? right? Uh, it's a combination of other... Hold on. Uh, so his name is Karun Dintrasi. It is all one, one word. word. Yeah. It's one word. It, it is? is spelled, yep. Yes. <laughs> oh, no. It is spelled... Get your pens out. Here we go. Oh, boy. Uh, it is spelled K-A-R-R-U-N-D-E-N-T-R-A-S-S-I. Why, why Karun Uh First off, it's pulled from a couple uh, different other names uh, that I don't remember <laughs> off the top of my head. One of them's from uh, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and the other is something else. Um, I think actually a different character from some old d, &D thing that I was looking through, but there is... Uh, some background lore uh, that wasn't really talked about and may never be talked about, but there's some stuff in uh, Crude and Trossi's backstory. There's a reason that uh, that name is the way it is, and it's because of the way that my naming convention works for certain stuff. That sounds very vague. It's to avoid spoilers for something that might be revealed at some point in the future. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yes, there's, there's, there's a... There's a uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason it's long and weird, and it's the reason that some other characters have long, weird names as well. Oh, yeah. I gotta ask Austin, how do you spell mm -hmm. Davion? Just, just let the people <laughs> know now. How Davion, is it spelled? Okay. Davion, Davion my know. intention was yes. D-A-V-I-O-N. By the way, um, Opal Rea on Twitter. <laughs> no, that's uh, normal. Yeah, that is the way that one would be spelled. Is, uh, yeah. wait, is that a real name? I think she can't remember. It is, it is. Uh, yeah. I think, think okay. Kavian no. is a real name. Da Davion anyway. I'm not as sure about. Anyway, it sounds weird because I do it with a silly voice, but uh, it is, uh, it's spelled, I think, with a two A's in one of the, the descriptions, and the reason it wasn't changed is because there was a lot going on that day. <laughs> nah. I, didn't, I didn't bring it up. Uh, it's not that important, but uh, Opal Rea on Twitter has a great document going that I have uh, modded, mm -hmm. uh, that I've, I've edited, that has the, uh, uh, the characters, uh, both PCs and NPCs, with their names, so that's still in progress, but if you have questions, a lot of them can be found there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this next question comes from the email. Uh, how much of a character arc did everyone and Austin from the DM seat running the arcs have planned at the beginning of season one? Has that changed? And do you have more arcs planned for your characters now, or are you leaving it up to chance? So how much did you kind of have an idea going into this of like what the arc for your character would be? Uh, and how has it, I guess, changed or has it stayed the same? Uh, Noir, I think this is interesting for you and me because the way that this is kind of <laughs> broken down is not, not to immediately hijack this, but every season has more or less about. followed one character and had like a big yeah. moment for them. Uh, so obviously yeah. we started with Kiana, then Finbar just had a season, and not to speak for Austin, but it looks like it's shaping up to be a <laughs> Virla heavy season three. Um, and I'm curious if, you know, has, uh, is this kind of where you saw the character going when we started, or has it changed a lot since we started playing? Well, a, a great thing about D&D &D is that because it's collaborative you don't 
you don't necessarily have a, a full one hundred percent idea of where your character is going to go. I think mm-hmm. at the beginning, I think at the beginning of of before we even started, you know, recording season one, uh, like the blurb that Virla has, like way back, if you scroll back through like Twitter or Instagram or something, is like he's you know uh, curious about the world and ready to learn more about the world and himself. Like that was pretty much resolved in like episode seven of season <laughs> one, basically by the what he really wanted to figure out. And he, I didn't even realize this. It really didn't come out until you know that moment in episode seven where Maxim had told him you know, the names of his crew. Um, and that was kind of a turning point as far as how I perceived how Virla was going to go because I had realized that a lot of his action so far was um, a lot of uh, coping and, you know, uh, co- <laughs> like like compartmentalizing uh, that loss that he had experienced. And then when he heard those names again, it felt like a piece of him had been... A piece of him he didn't know it was lost was found again. And so then... You know, in the in the eight month gap between season one and two, that was him in a period of like healing, and so he was able to move past it, um, be a little more active with the group. He got a little like he, he, emotionally, and at, at least you know how he spoke. He was you know more joking with the crew and more catty, I suppose. <laughs> a, a through line that continued way way through season two. And I was pretty, I was basically content for that uh, up until the moment that apparently, uh, if you look through the abyss in any aspect, not just like personally walking through it, but like, yep. bing, that counts. I didn't know that. Um, it and then the madness happened. I didn't plan for that. I mean, oh, Austin put it. Austin could have foresaw it. He's he's, he's, he's he's really the good madness. at predicting. Yeah. Sorry. Finish your thing. I thought I want to talk about the madness after that. Uh, yeah, Austin's really good at predicting what the heck I'm gonna do, uh, because, <laughs> you know, like, episode 5, season 1 or whatever, he had this young Firbolg ask, like, why are there trees? And I <laughs> Virla, and Virla gave this long, an- or like, why are there forests or something like that? And it, mm-hmm. Like, forests are big, I forget. And then Virla gave this really long-winded answer, and Austin, n- none of that was planned. Austin knew that I was gonna respond with, like, this long, poignant answer, and then he just kind of, like, slapped me across the face with, like, a really kid- a kitty answer, like, no, nah, it's because there's trees. And I'm like, yeah, that's yeah. expected. Yeah. So I don't know if Austin necessarily planned that Virla saw a portal and so he was going to look through it. But regardless, the effect was that he contracted some sort of madness of uh, Zuktmoy, essentially. <laughs> um, and the way that I decided to sort of manifest that was not uh, placing hallucinations in his head, but more taking the anxieties that he had in him and ramping them up, basically. And so his doubts about his placement with his crew, you know, whether he is friends with them. He A lot of his actions have been in acts of service, and so he wasn't <laughs> sure if he was friends with them or if he's just useful to them. A lot of that came to light. And then the fucking despondency well or whatever, he had to, oh, you know, yeah. cast his mind back even further right. uh, and, and think about his time alone on the ship. Um so all of that was like a perfect storm for Austin to set up the fucking ring thing. Viral is not really Viral is not an arrogant person, but what, the moment, the moment that Austin saw that ring, like things were flashing be- before his eyes, like things were he, he was already scheming and stuff, and so um, all of that basically led into you know the conclusion of of episode ten. Uh, Finbar gifted the ring to Virla and. Uh, that's all that happened. Nothing else happened after that. (laughs) (laughs) That was the end of the episode. Yeah. Um, But yeah, I I, I guess, yeah, to to wrap that up real quickly, um, I did not have a sense that this is how the arc of Virla was going to go, but it seems very clear now, and it makes a lot of sense in retrospect, and I'm very excited to see where that goes in season three. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that there's a lot that we want to talk about in terms of that last episode. Um, so I won't touch on any of that. And there's a ton of good stuff you just said in there, Noir. But I do want to say for the, uh, in terms of the madness thing, I, in a classic hubris move, I put what I knew to be a portal to, uh, oh God, what's the name? The 222nd layer of the Abyss has a name. It's where Zuktamoy and Dweeblex live. Um, Dweeblex? Dweeblex. Yeah. Uh, it's where they both Dweeblex. live. Slime guy. Uh, yeah, slime, slime Lord, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tens of Slimes. Uh, and Gross. I just assumed that y'all wouldn't do anything with it because I'm a big <laughs> dumb dummy. Uh, you then, saw R2, then, high int, low whiz builds, and you were like, they're uh-huh. going to leave this thing alone. <laughs> Put a yeah, because I, assumed, I, I thought it was going to be such a laser-focused combat. I assumed that it was no, going to no, be no. very goal-oriented. Yeah, no, then, no, no, no. 
when you start messing with it, I was like, okay. And I opened up. Let's focus. And, uh, Let's when, focus. You, when you were coming to uh, a certain radius of Zogtomoy's lair, which I interpreted fucking with its connection or gazing upon it to, uh, to also trigger it. That's why I think in the episode they say this gets a little like out of rules as written. But it's like, mm -hmm. if you gaze upon it, it's basically the same thing to me. Uh, mm -hmm. I rolled, Zogtomoy has a madness table. And just yes. so everyone knows, uh, yeah. Danny rolled, uh, I see visions in the world around me that others do not. Mm -hmm. And Virla rolled, I see an altered version of reality, with my mind convincing itself that things are true, even in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. So, yeah. that's, that's what happened there. Yeah. <laughs> I think to sort of yeah. circle around to the question as it was asked, though, like, I didn't have yeah. any sort of arc in mind for Danny when we started this campaign. Uh, and since playing, I think maybe I've landed in a direction I kind of want to take her character in these last two seasons. Yes. But I think the nature mm -hmm. of the this game and that it is kind of a big improv exercise uh, is that no matter where you start with, it, it's going to change as you play. Um, I'd be interested yeah. to hear um, Red or, or, or Wally because you guys have had... Uh, obviously, you know, your characters can continue to grow and change, but, like, big arcs for your characters pretty early on. Uh, Unless they die. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that'd be, <laughs> Thanks, that'd be a big turning point. Yeah. 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 You can't kill me. It would be very narratively unsatisfying at this juncture. <laughs> but have, you, have your characters changed uh, since kind of their inception, or did you have any sort of arc in mind for them that we've seen play out? Oh, for sure. Um, yeah, uh, I... Kiana, I mean, I think a lot of us kind of started out as a little bit of a blank slate. Like, this is a kind of a new setting. Didn't really want to go in with a plot in mind because that is a very good way to cause problems <laughs> at a table. Uh, if you come in with an idea for what you want your character to end up as, uh, it or like, I, I've said before that oftentimes, like, if you design a character whose point is, like, to be cool, you're going to uh, fall flat on your face at least once, and then you're going to have trouble staying immersed in the game. So I try not to have too many like intentions when I go into a character of like what I want this character to do and be. But I had these sort of likely tra uh, trajectories for what I figured would work for her. Um, obviously the uh, uncovering of the whatever the deal with the um, uh, the monastery was was kind of a big part of that. But because I didn't actually know what the deal with the monastery was, I had no idea what direction that was going to go. I thought it was fully possible that me running away might unintentionally like doom something really important because mm -hmm. it's like oh yeah these guys kind of suck but i don't actually know if they're malicious or maybe they're just real hard asses about this whole monk thing uh so depending on what the ramifications of running away were that could have gone in a whole bunch of different directions uh and then after that uh i was sort of i was a little bit unsure there were a lot of different ways that things could work but kiana's kind of fundamentally reactive at this stage she's very not used to having agency uh and doesn't really know what to do with it yet but I have a couple ideas for for ways that that might shift in season three. Uh, mm. And it works because in character, it also makes sense for her to be like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> I can do things other than just like the monk stuff I was taught to do by those weird squid people, mm -hmm. you know. It's mm -hmm. the, so, yeah, uh, through season two, she's a bit more of like a kind of a supporting character, which was very much intentional on my part. It is incredibly stressful being the center of attention in a large improv game, mm -hmm. <laughs> especially because this Agreed. was the first time I'd ever done an actual play. Yeah. Uh, so I was like, oh God. Uh, I, I had like, I don't know if I mentioned this, in the lead up to the season one finale, I had like actual stress dreams about how bad things could go and what that <laughs> right. could wow. be. Wow, yeah. oh my God. Yeah. Uh, I did too. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and when it resolved the way it did, I was like, oh, thank God. This is, like, the best of all the possible outcomes <laughs> I was considering. Um, uh, and through season two, kind of being in the background and, like, supporting people and, and being helpful was very fun. But I think as gears are kind of turning, because, like, obviously the thing with Suvi really ro rose more questions than it answered, uh, raised more questions, and uh, that's a little that's a little frustrating, and I don't think she's quite sure what to do with that yet. <laughs> um and it's all sort of serving to jostle her out of this position of like, she went from one position of not quite content, but doesn't really know what to do about it to now a different position of not quite content, but doesn't know what to do about it. And is starting to get the hint of like, maybe I can do something about it. So we'll see what season three holds. Yeah. 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 Wally, what about uh, you? Did you have any ideas on Finbar? Uh, well, I mean, when I make characters, I tend to um have like kind of threads that i'm willing to let the dm pull and you know and i've played with austin uh enough to when i wrote finbar's backstory i'm like okay great this is what i'm giving you to work with um mm -hmm. so when we uh started the second season he's like okay great we're gonna make this all about the chef deal i'm like okay great that's cool we get to um 
explore sort of uh, a more well-connected character. You know, Finbar um, knows a lot of people and has done a lot of things. He's he's more of uh, not necessarily a seasoned adventurer. He's more ingrained in um, sort of the world of the Planescape. You know, he's already spent time on another spell jammer um, and had spent time in the city of Sigil. Um, so uh, I had no idea what Austin was planning in terms of uh, the things that he had going on. Um, as for me, what I expect in terms of character arc, I live and die by the dice. So uh, anything yeah. random that comes up, like I, I lean into it. Um, and while Finbar is not typically uh, the kind of person who would lean into the chaos, luckily I have uh, Sophia and Noir uh, willing to push those buttons for me, and they've done a fantastic <laughs> job. <laughs> um, Someone's got to push him. You put a button in front of us, it's only right yeah. that somebody pushes it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe like just this once, <laughs> we can disappoint the DM a little bit and do the safe thing. No. No, please never. No. There were so many good... We got to ask some questions. There were so many yeah. good questions yeah, coming no, 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 in. No, let's we're going to move on to another one, but this question... Yep. Um, this is, I feel like, addressing the elephant in the room of this whole Q&A from Smith the Spirit mm -hmm. in chat. A uh, question for Noir. Are you just the type of insane big brain that can just off the dome soliloquize a wish spell? Or do you have a process for preparing speeches for a game? And can you just, like, did you write that ahead of time? No, that was off the dome. No, yes, I wrote it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not, I am not skilled in that regard. Uh, yeah, no, uh, since, so, I mean, since we recorded episode nine, uh, I kind of, and I did, while we were recording episode nine, Virla was like, it'd be cool if I had it, but let's be honest, it's probably going to go to either Finbar or Elise. And then, like, near the end of episode 9, it became apparent that if Finbar got the ring, he's going to probably give it to Virla. Um, that kind of got my brain, uh, you know, churning a little bit. So basically, like, for the next five days, I was kind of thinking about, like, what Virla would do, because I knew that he, I knew that he, it was going to be private, Mm -hmm. He he wasn't being secretive when he decided to wait to cast the wish. He was it was private for him, um, and so he just didn't really want anyone uh, witnessing it. Um, and then also he was thinking about like, was that person that I saw in the weave really Mistra, or was I hallucinating? Fuck it, let's try and guess anyway. And so basically, all those things were sort of churning in my head. How does Virla think about the gods? What can I do to kind of tie Mistra to me wanting to find my crew together? And then like the day before. I wrote it, and then it, it took me like an hour to write it, and then another hour to kind of like change some stuff around and make the thing flow better. Having that through line of like names having power, uh, evoking Mistra that way, and then also bringing that back to his crew. Um, and then like right before the session, I like did another 15 minutes of, of editing in that regard. Uh, I don't really have a process for how the speeches go. Uh, it's not like I do this on a, on a regular basis. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, he, it was just kind of like, for me, a confluence of a lot of things that Virla had sort of experienced through the entire season. And I guess that was, that, that was also a through line to, to, for a bit. Like, what, has every, what is everything that Virla has learned in this season? And how can you sort of tie this in? So there was like a line in the very beginning where he was like, I have seen what God, I have seen how gods treat their worshippers as nothing more than parasites. I was referencing Hans in that. Like, I saw how, I <laughs> yeah. saw how Hans was being treated by... Astral Khonshu, I forget his name. Uh, <laughs> oh, God, what was his name? Yeah, Arcadios? Yeah. Arcadios. Oh, yeah, of course. Sure. Uh, it's hard okay. to do it and not say yeah. it in the accent, I feel like is the problem. Arcanos. Yeah. But yeah, and then basically, so basically I, I wrote it like the day before, and then the day following I just kind of practiced it and tried to figure out how the flow would go, and then it and then it happened. I didn't do that off the off the top of my brain i had the doc in front of me and i, I was just i was reading from it so um <laughs> it definitely yeah the, the, editing that was so fun because i'm like oh right like noir can act <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. absolutely <laughs> fantastic great way to end oh, wow. the season this is shakespearean um, it was so funny that Austin was like, I'm going to drop in a little, another little Mistra teaser just for funsies. And Nora was like, <laughs> like I'm on it. Thought, I'm on it. Yeah. One more thing. I could not believe <laughs> yeah. completely. Yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah. There's an ice cream truck going by my house. But we'll move on to another question. This one comes from yeah. chat again from Artie Thompson. Uh, question, if the rest of the Per Aspera crew had to semi-seriously enter something into the cooking competition, what would they <laughs> enter? So we obviously go. we sort of okay. joked about the peanut butter crackers early on, but like if everyone was, if all their characters were actually submitting something into this cooking competition, what do you think that they would have entered? Ooh. 
I think with all the sincerity in her heart, she would have Kiana would have made a fruit salad. Uh, <laughs> no cooking involved, just oh, fruits yeah. from different places all in one bowl. Because <laughs> it's like, look, it's like the bounty of the Planescape. Isn't this cool? Uh, Danny, because this is how I make s'mores, but I, I'm the kind of person who likes to just like incinerate the marshmallows so that it's just completely crusty on the outside. So I feel like Danny would make like a, just a s'mores platter uh, and all the marshmallows have to look like that. Like they're just completely burned up, but mm-hmm. they're so gooey inside. Don't come mm-hmm. for me for that. I'm uh, right about mm-hmm. this and I'm not taking any notes. <laughs> mm. yes. I'm I'm also drawing from experience for this. Uh, during the pandemic, I, I was the guy who was like really into baking, and so mm-hmm. I, 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 I it was the point where I like baked bread every week for, for yeah. a good portion of oh, time. Damn. I like baking over cooking because you have to be so exact with, or it's it's not like even if you are exact with cooking, there's still things you kind of have to do to adjust things in in order to make the meal work. But with baking, it's either really forgiving or it's so or or like so it's one of the two. But like I was just oh okay I have to just put X amount of cups in I have to you know have the loaf prove for X minutes and then here I have bread and it's actually decent and that feels very Virla like so I think yeah. Virla would actually do some sort of baked good yeah. and then my mind went to uh, Amari Guishon who's that mm, sick nasty guy, guy who yeah. makes you know, all those yeah. chocolate like marbles <laughs> yeah. and stuff also That's... known as that fucking chocolate guy <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. Virla would do that yeah for nice. sure nice nice. Uh, this next question comes from our email. Uh, out of all the d- dishes Finbar has cooked, which one is your favorite, and which one would you like to eat in real life the most? Oh, I'm gonna try right, to. We're gonna put a bunch of cooking questions together now, so that we're all appropriately hungry in like an hour and a half. <laughs> I'm oh, already on, hungry. Please. <laughs> oh, me too. Yeah. Oh, I got God. shit to do today. To dinner tonight. <laughs> That that lamb feast that Finbar was sort of alluding to with the mm. dead golden ram or whatever. Ooh, yeah. I was Ooh, like that, that yeah. Good. That's good. Yeah. I like that. Uh we had um uh we did um leading into the second season, we had a bit where uh we had gone to a previous plane at some point for a job and we had gotten <laughs> oh my God, some right. wine. Oh, yeah. Um, it's not necessarily food, but, uh, anytime there was like, uh, uh, we did something fancy and Finbar brought out wine, I would have thought it would have been, uh, that bottle of wine. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, everything else I have like on a table, it's got like upwards of like 20 different, uh, things, uh, <laughs> that he's could have made, uh, throughout the season. Uh, but yeah. I feel like the like you always you put a lot of quiches and omelets for breakfast. Yeah, and, uh, a lot of breakfast a foods. Of yes, I feel like those are the things that I, yeah. I, Sophia, would most want to eat that Finbar makes in real life. But also, I think Danny likes them because they're easy to put hot sauce on. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. I like to try right. quantum juice. Question. Yeah. Oh, the quantum juice I is great too. Oh, juice, yeah. 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 This question comes from the chat from, oh boy, Dmitrika Koprinkova. I'm so sorry about saying that name wrong. Uh, question for Austin. Do you have any house rules regarding the rules as written versus the rule of cool dichotomy? So how do you decide, you know, mm-hmm. when to go with what? Oh my goodness. Um, That's a great question, actually. Do I have anything written down about it? No, but I do have a, a <laughs> thought process on it, which is that uh, this is... In many ways, uh, people talk about uh, D&D, especially D&D 5e, being like a power fantasy. I sometimes think it's more of like a competency fantasy, but that's a weird distinction. But regardless, um, it's a, the characters want to be uh, successful, and their character sheet offers them uh, lots of tools to do that, but sometimes isn't enough. The idea of Rule of Cool is to empower them on unique edge cases to do something that is not written down is not to allow them to break the game because the way they break it would simply just because the way that they want to break it would be very very cool right Mm -hmm. it's about finding edge cases that the rules don't account for and making those as fun as the player wants them to be and in most cases making their character fit with the idea that they have in their head so you just have to keep in mind uh, the rule, the quote rules of your world, not the actual written down, but how you think of things working in your world, right? Like how high magic is it, for example? Most D&D games fall into the same level, but there's lots of variety out there that you can play with. And uh, make sure that you're not setting up any precedence for things to be problems in the future. But uh, yeah, there's certainly... And you know... 
I find that in terms of rule of cool, there's always space to, if this is something that's small and potentially recurring, there's always space to expand it in the future. But if you give a PC a power and then have to redact it, they're going to feel bad about that. So I tend to err on the side of caution. And if, for example, a monk is constantly carrying people and that's something that's become a, a <laughs> theme and I've realized that the rule, uh, expanding the rules uh, beyond material, like how they are currently rules is written, which is you're at half speed, is probably not actually going to break the game that much, then, uh, then you know, then there's, there's room there to rule of cool it away. But if I had just the first time said, uh, yeah, whatever, you're, you're strong, just run with them, and then it had become a problem, I'm sure that it would have been worse to have that ability taken away. Mm -hmm. So that's my thought on it. Yeah. It's pretty decent. Yeah. yeah. So this next question. I would describe myself as pretty decent. <laughs> <laughs> I would too. So this next question is also from chat. Uh, this comes from unnecessary. Uh, nope, wrong person. So sorry. Uh, thanks for being in the chat. Unnecessarily epic. Uh, <laughs> uh, this question comes from Shadow W. Uh, to Sophia, how many trapdoors are on the Paraspora and do you have a canon map of them? Uh, oh, I did boy. give Austin a map where I drew on all the trapdoors at one point. Uh, <laughs> so that's what I consider canon, but I think it's funnier if you don't know where they are, so I'm not going to tell anyone how many of them are in what location. More than one. More than one. Yeah. Um, I one too many. <laughs> Some of them connect. Mm. Some of them connect. I always thought of it as like they're flaps between walls, but then obviously we've had yes. an instance of where there's there appeared to be some sort of tunnel situation going on. So I think I might have to actually update the map on my end just so that I know what it is. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, yeah, it's, yeah. It's I did. Funny. I did think about this. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's justified if like there's like a you know a two and a half foot gap between like the floor of one deck and then the ceiling of the other so that would kind of be the crawl space mm. in the floor like for instance know, like, in episode system, four or whatever you know, like you're crawling through the ducks i guess that could qualify <laughs> are how are there ducks on a boat <laughs> you know ducks they're on boats yeah yeah this is, um... uh, sure yeah all right <laughs> <laughs> uh this next question comes from our email so how will the release of Spelljammer Adventures in Space affect Season 3? And will the release Ooh. of the Planescape book mm. next year affect future seasons? Or will you all continue to carve out your interpretation of the setting? Uh, obviously, there has been some official uh, D&D 5e slash 1 uh, questions coming out. Uh, and, and our show is Spelljammer Planescape based. And we did not plan that to sync up at all. So it's... Uh, no. <laughs> So Austin, I don't but know, excuse the dish, though, one, and more particular in how the rules and the setting might be implemented. Yeah, there was writing on the wall for a long time, though, and there was writing on the wall before they even announced Planescape. Uh, mm -hmm. But how is this going to change in the future? Probably not much. Uh, it would be very disrupt, disrupt. It would be a big disruption to the uh, uh, the game if we were to adopt the new kind of cosmology that they've established where in the astral seas between different prime material plane different like planets basically with mm -hmm. crystals they're not crystal spheres anymore i think there's uh they're like wild space realms or something like that but that's essentially what they are is crystal spheres from the from the original regardless uh it would be very disruptive so we're not taking that um i like that they included sh actually there was a question that asked um yeah, oh, what do I think of the new Spelljammer rules? If you go to our subreddit, we actually have a subreddit. I made a post there, and I'm more than happy to chat with people if they have more questions about it. But I made a pretty lengthy post on my thoughts on the on the book. So for more details, you can check that. But basically, the rules for ships are pretty... Underwhelming. Underwhelming. Mm. Uh, I, I am happy because it gave me... I'm like, okay, this is how many hit points. There, theirs would be the galleon, essentially. It's mm -hmm. pretty... Uh, it's actually pretty close in most respects in terms of what I predicted, like the size and things like that. The speed is different, but we're going to keep the speed as it is because I want to reward uh, the players who have um, who are full casters and also Kiana because they get a bonus. <laughs> so I don't just want to nerf that down. Uh, but there are some things that I'm, I actually have literally in front of me right now because I was talking to my brother about <laughs> it. Um, I have the Paraspora stats uh, and a lot of it's pulled from the stat block. Um, AC hit points, damage threshold, uh, uh, repair rules, although I've added some. And the, I th uh, we'll take some stuff. There are some cool monsters, certainly, that I'm going to take. So I'm excited for that. But, uh, oh, the ability to use an action to switch the attunement 
of the helm between people is yeah. actually yeah. a really great idea. I loved that. It's gonna, yeah. I think, cut out some of the boring logistic nonsense of who wait who's attuned to the to the helm mm -hmm. i'm gonna fly it but i need to tune for now it's gonna cut that out which is awesome but mm -hmm. uh even in the book it's like a fifth level spell or something to make spell jamming helms which to me is way too easy that's nope that's not how it's done so what are we adapting some rule stuff some monsters are definitely going to make an appearance but uh over overall i wasn't hugely thrilled with the the box set i don't think a ton of stuff is gonna end up being relevant mm. So, there you go. Very cool. Uh, not to keep Austin talking, but this is another question for you from chat uh, from Dennis Denison. Please. Dennis Denison. Uh, question for Austin. What is the most important NPC that was not originally planned to be as important or relevant as they are? Most important... Re oh, oh, my goodness. I, that's actually... Because I actually haven't had the same snorkel problem with you guys, I find. Um, it seems to me that when I make a character and I find them very interesting, you guys just gravitate to that character and that works out pretty well uh i th thought we might have seen max that's the opposite of the question though he's important we haven't seen him as much um uh that's re that's a really good question oh you know what i will say this so the party i had a whole list of npcs that you could have potentially interacted with and uh a little rolling and a little decision by myself on what would be dramatic uh, I ended up, Davian ended up being one of those characters, and <laughs> he, has, he has popped up and is actually yeah. maybe it's again. Favorite, yeah. But I had no idea, you know, I, there was 20 NPCs or something I wrote for that for that encounter, and you met some of them, some of them were little cameo things, but he seemed to be the one that I think that you talked to the most in the end, and as a result, but there was like, there was a Hell Knight there who was super cool, uh, oh. there, I mentioned that there was a, there's a Druid Plasmoid who was there, there's a cool warlock. There's like all sorts of characters who were there, um, and you got to talk to some of them. There was oh, there was an Azer that Danny spoke to as a oh, yeah. like build up to, but the, he had like political <laughs> ties, so there could have been important like brass. Like if you had chose, if there had been time to go down that route, there could have been like important brass stuff that came up, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's lots of things, but uh, that that could have happened, but Davian happened, and aren't we happy? <laughs> I freaking love Davian. <laughs> Yeah. We could have had a lot of important people, but instead we got Davian. You know, I think that that's the best possible outcome from that party, is the Paraspera has managed to, you know, we, we've smoothed <laughs> with some important folks, but also we met this guy, and he's fine. He's just a dude. <laughs> he's just a, he's a I dude. Just that man that played the street, trying to get by. <laughs> no, not even, he's not as cool as that. <laughs> no. Well, is he cool and we've just dunked on him to the point where he's not cool anymore, or... Has he never been called? Cool? We're immediately right at clocking him as such. I think Davion is at his most endearing when he's at his most pathetic. Yes. So <laughs> he's a poor yeah. little meow meow. I think that Davion is the hero of his own story, but we just happen to be a little higher level than him. So from our perspective, he's just an absolute hilarious punk. Uh, yeah. It's one of those cases where you know a lot of these NPCs. It's a it's a Schrodinger cat situation where. Are they very cool or are they very, very silly? You don't know until one, you start playing them, but also two, the dice come out. Because yeah. if he had yeah. rolled two crits in round one against those mushrooms, yeah. you guys would have been like, this is the most capable sword fighter in all of the yeah. planescape. Right. Yeah. Uh, instead, he couldn't get them. He no. just kept rolling shit. And so yeah. you guys are like, this guy sucks. I feel like Davion is a character from the Princess Bride transplanted into the planescape. And yes. exactly. I just find that very delightful. I think it might have been Noir. Oh, we were talking yeah. offline about this at some point. It's like, oh, Davian's kind of like the tuxedo mask of our universe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You didn't like, do you didn't season do one, Tuxedo Mask, before yeah. he actually becomes, like, relevant and yeah, capable like, to... Like, my <laughs> yeah. is done, you didn't even do anything, Tuxedo Mask. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so just put him in distress, and we'll rescue him in season three, yeah. and have a great time. Exactly. I love I love how canonically he's just, like, an Uber driver who's really struggling yeah. for tips now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, it's hard to get started when you don't have any clients, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, we'll take another question from chat. So this comes from Daniel Ground Please. to uh, Noir. What caused you to decide on specifically asking Mistra for help instead of wishing for the information? Uh, so why did you? Decide? Oh yeah. I mean, if it's not a spoiler, why did you decide to call on a good old Mistra? Well, uh, Austin dangled her in front of me, so I <laughs> grabbed at it, grabbed yeah. at her throat, and and never let go. Uh, yeah, no. Um, I, it was 
Honestly, it really stemmed from Virla's notion that if you word a wish poorly, it could not go in your favor. And then that got me thinking, like, who actually receives and executes a wish, you know? Like, right. it could be, if you're, if you're asking a god or, like, it's religion-based, then it might be the god that answers that. But I think most of the time it would be the goddess of magic herself. So what better way to make sure that your wish, wish goes as intended than just by... Cutting, cutting the middleman and going straight to the straight to the person who's going to execute it. Uh, so, and to make sure that she doesn't do anything wrong, he's going to have a very close eye because you know he he contractually obligated her to do it. So, yeah, <laughs> honestly, that was the reason why. Very nice. Uh, we'll take another question from our email. Uh, hello, guys. You mentioned that you might be doing a one shot or other bonus content between now and season three, and please do because January is so far away. Uh, good news on that front, we're definitely going to be dropping a little something-something on Halloween, so stay tuned for more about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but to the players, if you were to hijack the DM seat for a day, where would the group be going, <laughs> and what would they be doing? Uh, and on a similar mm. note, when are we Whoa. getting the Han shot we all deserve? <laughs> I'm so glad that everyone <laughs> in the audience uh, enjoyed Hans as much as we did. Uh, it was really fun mm. to have Blue on. Uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll be able to, you know, drag him back someday, who can say. But for now, um, if players, if we were hijacking the DM seat... Where are we sending the crew of the Paraspora for an adventure? Ooh. Oh, oh man. man, great question. Yeah. Um, I would say I were to one shot something. Uh, we didn't spend enough time um, in the Shadowfell. Um, oh God! Yeah, I yeah. think uh, running some sort of like uh, like haunted forest. You know, throw a hag in there. I love hags. Mm -hmm. um for the party to you know go up against um some riddles some dark fairies uh yeah. why not uh I, I guess kind of in a similar vein just i guess taking something out of or taking inspiration from oh man is it witch of the wild light or wild of the witch light i can't remember wild anymore. beyond the witch light wild yes the witch light. uh yes. but going back to the Feywild, wild because we saw just a very small slice of it in the very, little corner Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was one that was close to Finbar's heart, and so it was very much associated with, with feelings of home that uh, to Finbar that, you know, propagated through the crew. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the Feywild that could kill you more often than not, and so yes. that'd be fun to, <laughs> to run something. Uh, actually, that reminds me of another thing. Uh, do we want to tell the thing that we didn't tell Sophia at the beginning? <laughs> we never oh, really oh did follow goodness. up on it. It didn't oh. really come up, yeah. So, really uh, canonic. Canonically, in episode five, when we exited the Feywild, Danny lost her memory. Uh, uh, before yeah. season two, uh, the, we had four of, the four of us no, like hit wait. up a group chat and was like, "Hey, do you guys want to like be in agreement that like uh, you guys what? either went back to the Feywild or did another thing in the Feywild where uh, Agden actually came back as a revenant yes. zombie, which was yeah. something was that was yeah. yeah, which which was which was something." Uh, asked by like someone in, in twitter and austin was like yeah. that's too good of an idea to like just send to the wayside yeah uh and so it also I, belongs to someone else so i didn't want to run that as an adventure yeah but, so right uh, it, but it canonically and we like mentioned it like once or twice in like the one of the yeah, first two episodes. it got fully kind of, glossed over <laughs> yeah and glossed over it but canonically yeah, there was an additional adventure in, in the feywild where every where the crew of the paraspera had to deal with agden again as a resurrected zombie and danny forgot all of it yeah. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Canonically, yeah. they went back. They dealt with. They fought Agden again as a recurring bad guy, what? and they yes. failed to win save on the way. Yeah. 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 We were we were joking about a lot of different possibilities. There was one where what we we'd like suggested that maybe we. I wish I could remember the name of the module. It's like a legendary. Like you fight some crazy vampire guy. Oh, uh, oh no, 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 no. Yeah. 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 There was, I, I do we, remember because we, we had a conversation about. Uh, you know, obviously there's a big gap of downtime between seasons one and two. It's like, oh, the crew probably did other stuff in the meantime. Like, we could keep yes. referencing like yep. the Barovia incident or something. Uh -huh. yeah. That, uh -huh. I remember. Yeah. Danny not <laughs> having gone back to the Feywild. <laughs> yes. You were yeah. specifically kept out of it. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, was... we did not want somebody to know about that one. Yes. No, yeah. Yeah. But you hey, fanfic writers, yeah. that's that's a goldmine right there. <laughs> the lost yeah. episode. Bamboozled? Hoodwinked <laughs> on my own show? Uh -huh. hey, yeah. That'd be fun though, running a one shot that takes place within between that within that eight yeah. month downtime because like, it's, it's not great. like it's not like they were doing nothing. There's yeah. other stuff happened too. Yeah, and the um, status quo is safe, so nobody can die yeah. uh, mm -hmm. yeah. permanently. Yeah. Exactly. I uh, think if Danny was gonna like, or if I was gonna run a one shot, I, I think something that I think is very funny is that Danny is kind of the only person who can fix the ship really adequately. Like Vila could probably wing it, 
but uh, I do like the idea of like, oh, Danny has to go to the DMV this week, so the session's just gonna all take place. Parasper <laughs> like slowly falling apart. Like we don't even leave Doc. It's Parasper just... a bottle episode. <laughs> Parasper yeah. a bottle episode. Yes. We take Danny out of the oh, equation and see how well the rest of the crew can like keep the ship from falling apart. Yeah. Yeah. I I have never DM'd and I have never before this game played 5e. So uh, my only idea is extremely vague and it's kind of similar to what we did in the episode with Stranger. Um, but I, I think what I could probably do is I could world build a location where some shit went down, Minds of Moria style. <sighs> and I could drop everybody okay. in it and just let the mystery play out as it will of like, I, I know the answer. That. I've got all the hints. I could just, you know, have the whole map and then be like, all right, kids, go nuts. Uh, so that I feel like is up to that. That's something I could actually run uh, rather than some ambitious concept. And like, <laughs> I don't know where we could put it. You could even put it in like actual like the material plane, uh, like yeah. a whole classic dungeon. Yeah, there's because cool I feel, stuff in the material plane. There is. So and a lot it's of history right. where, where weird we're shit has happened. It's, it's yeah. all right. Yeah. That's yeah. sort of the underlying irony of the whole campaign is that everywhere you go, everyone thinks it's fit. Everywhere is fantastical except for the place they're from and also the mundane plane. They're like, oh, it sucks. <laughs> and the yeah. mundane plane is where all the mover and shakers, uh, yeah. all, all that stuff yeah. is happening. Like, yeah. the, and the mundane plane is, uh, is uh, dynamic in a way that the rest of the worlds are not. Mm -hmm. So because the rest of the worlds are ruled by, uh, by, um, uh, by alignment and the mundane plane is not it's it's the new it's the true neutral world not like sigil it's it's where any tools are in so yeah. uh that's that's like the underlying irony where everyone's like oh that place sucks and there's tons of shit happening there all the time <laughs> yeah i'd also well, like it's like everyone who like... disses new york without ever going to yeah. new york yeah, what are you yeah. doing? <laughs> i'd also like to run a one shot uh that focuses on everyone on the Paraspora's familiars and little little yeah, guys so oh like, god have... yeah yeah oh, so one shot so plug, so... It, yeah, yeah. Uh, it'd be like the equivalent of like uh, the the trinket honey heist that critical yes. did or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, we're have or actually, recently the familiar. Each like if yeah. one person's running it, we, we got plug the pixies mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. and now we're gonna have well, a pseudo dragon. Pseudo dragon. dragon. Yeah. 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 Pseudo dragon. Yeah. I need to get a weird little guy. <laughs> well, I had, yeah. I you know I didn't want to. Um, to me, it wouldn't make any sense for Kurt and Jossie to have forced the egg on anyone no. uh, because, you know, he's kind of in debt to all of you. But I think he mm -hmm. does mention he was like, oh, you know, you did technically carry me out, Kiana, if you wanted it. Yeah. Um, as soon as so you said it was a pseudo dragon, I regretted so badly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh. Uh... Uh... I yeah. could have had a, I could have had my own little uh, Lockheed, and it would have been great. This is actually this is an interesting. Um, information for players uh lockheed oh my god yeah shout out to kitty pride uh, yeah right it's, a, it's an interesting information thing where i knew that red would i mean anyone would really like but i knew that red would really like it and um i think there's a better way to con of conveying information to players without just telling spelling things out for them mm -hmm. um where perhaps that could have gone down but you know what there's always there's always room for more stuff in the future so there's uh, always, you always know, room for more That's, weird little there's guys. always more room for i told my uh wally and i have been dm'd by uh our friends zach for for four years now five years now yeah four yeah and zach is famous for killing any pets you have because oh my, yes. not on purpose but what happens is that <laughs> like if you have a wolf it has like 15 yes. hit points and uh, then there's a fireball and it dies so my brother and, just lost two pets in the last session oh, <laughs> yes and i told him for every pet he kills i'm gonna add one to my campaign so yeah. Yeah, that's why <laughs> nice <laughs> A few Very people nice. in chat are say are asking if Suvi counts as my weird little guy, and I feel like I am actually Suvi's weird little guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Technically, okay. I, okay. I think the so. Yeah. Okay. The coming together. It's here's our lineup. We got Plug. We got the unnamed pseudo dragon. Yeah. <laughs> we got the pixies. We got Bing, and we have Kiana. <laughs> and yeah. That's yeah. All yes. Weird little guy. That's it. Technically, Perfect. technically, since Bing has to be manifested from Virla. And it has a, it, it can't go further than 300 feet from Virla. I guess Virla has to be in it in some capacity too. Maybe just like <laughs> lagging behind, I guess. Virla's I don't just know. Taking over we'll the make it work. The tanning spot on the top deck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone gets up to shenanigans. Uh, we'll take another question. <laughs> Kiana's the one human. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yes. 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 Oh, it's what Fantastic. I Fantastic. Uh, 
Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Next question. Uh, next question. Next question yeah. from the Boom. chat. This comes from Overthink Knight. Can I have a head count of who's DM before or has any gaming background? I've watched a couple other actual plays by now, and you're all so interesting to watch, listen to, and I'm trying to draw a connection. Thank you so Ooh. much uh, for saying that very nice thing about us <laughs> being interesting to watch and listen to. <laughs> Um, I've been playing D&D since high school. I've played a few other systems, I actually started in Pathfinder, um, and I've run short campaigns and one-shots in the past. Uh, Austin, Wally, Noir, I think you guys have the most experience uh, running games. Oh, in terms of... Yeah. Running games, yeah. Um, I've uh, run uh, a small campaign that was only about like eight months or so um, with Austin and a bunch of the rest of my friends. Um, I've also run a couple one shots, uh, in terms of gaming background, I've been a huge RPG fan for a very long time. Uh, I've played world of Warcraft, uh, dragon age, um, uh, mm-hmm. the new Baldur's gate three. I've been binging that it's still in early access, highly recommended if you want some more D and D content. Uh, but on top of that, I'm just a regular gamer. So like any a huge overwatch, uh, guy as well, I've played that for the past, uh, three years. Um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, games. Interestingly enough, I'm I'm not that. I, I I get and I buy like the RPG games. I haven't played Dragon Age, but um, uh, but more often than not, I just kind of want to be like, like a thief and stand in the corner and mm. save scum and just kind of like <laughs> ease my way and just stride through a dungeon after having killed everyone. Basically, that's how I play RPG <laughs> yeah. games. Uh, I I did a little bit of DMing. Uh, in small spurts, just like campaigns that never really hit it off. But the one where I, I really hit my stride was uh, the home game that I run that has, you know, Sophia, Austin, Austin's brother, Blue, Cyan, and a bunch mm-hmm. of other greens, basically. Like, we've all, we've all <laughs> played Blue yeah. at one point, basically. Uh, that went on since 2018. I had to take a bit of a break. Uh, to that, like th- at the beginning of this year. Mm-hmm. So I guess t- so. I guess it's been going on for four years. I haven't. I, I fully intend to get back into it, but mm-hmm. I am a graduate PhD student, so uh-huh. I don't have a lot of time. Yeah, that's Oof. the campaign where I named my bard Scarlet Red, yeah. and every time it's ever yeah. come up has been deeply confusing since I started it's working. It's been confusing. For yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, Austin. Oh, uh, well. Thanks. I've never DM'd my life because it scares the crap out of me, although I do think it would be cool at some point. Um, I basically got inducted into my parents' D&D group when I was nine years old and have sort of been <laughs> on and off playing RPGs ever since. Uh, at, you know, that was a group that, like, got together in college, like, in the AD&D era and has just kind of continued on since then. Um, so a lot of very, like, wacky homebrew stuff, uh, variants on different games there was a shadow run campaign for a while uh an exalted game that got homebrewed together with world of darkness that i've talked about um so and i uh was playing kind of a new newer tabletop game called numenera semi recently that i i had some mm-hmm. thoughts on but it had some very numenera. cool world building yeah it had some very uh, cool I world building at it i don't like that. the combat system at all but i really like the world building huh. um the setting is extremely cool and kind of allows you to just playground out some pretty crazy shit. But the the combat was so pared down that basically every character only has one thing they can do in combat and they do that over and over again until they beat the thing and that's just kind of not super fun. But uh, so I've probably got, I, I would guess, probably the greatest diversity of different games that I've been in campaigns for uh, and have, yeah. have tested out, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, but... 5e i was kind of new to i did actually have the source books for fourth edition uh the one that nobody talks about <laughs> i've got a 40 source book right behind me yeah I but uh my edition book sitting we're, all, we're covering a lot of editions between all of our respective yeah. departments i had like the full like two shelves worth of 3.5 supplements just because i i just love them so much they all had that really good look where it's like 3. like a leather 5. bound yeah it has yeah. a lot of good yeah. content a lot yeah. of good books they like they would make these like leather bound props with like inset gems and then photograph them and then use that as like the printed cover for the the hardcover stuff. I just loved them. They were so, so pretty. Yeah. Uh, and like every time we we'd go to the gaming shop, I'd like be like, "Ooh, they have a new supplement. <laughs> Let me just grab the complete scoundrel." Uh, I also spent a few years playing a lot of Warhammer 40k, which is why I went to a lot of game shops in that time. Uh, and then I stopped because it was the most expensive habit oh, I've ever God, had. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. Warhammer. Yeah. I yeah. want to play and I cannot afford to do. 
I had yeah, some fun with it, but I was also I was playing the edition where the Eldar were super nerfed compared to everybody else, and then like right after I stopped playing, they apparently fixed it. So that's huh. cool. Um, yeah, uh, that's I, I guess that's basically. It. I mean, I've played video games before, but like I feel like this is more in the yeah, <laughs> TCRPG yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Austin, did you um, go already, or did I just space? No, I am not. Um, <laughs> I, so <laughs> chronologically, I think I might have the smallest footprint of how long i've been playing D. &D. uh wally did you and i start on the exact same night with technically uh, yes. King's Thunder? Oh. Okay, yes yeah Wally might have been playing for the exact amount of time because we both start our first game was uh, a session of storm king's thunder which mm. uh i left halfway because i moved uh, halfway through that campaign but uh did eventually move back and return so I, I never ended up playing all that but i have basically played D, D at least once a week every single week since the <laughs> summer of 2018 yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, whether perfect. it's whether it's uh, Noir's game, which I played in weekly for a long time, uh, whether it's a uh, home game with Wally, which we did uh, Storm King's Thunder, Descent into Avernus, then rolled uh, uh, Wally's eight month campaign, and then rolled all three of those into uh, Rage of Tiamat, uh, an epic 14 to 20 adventure where mm -hmm. Avengers style the best of the best PCs from all of those uh, mm -hmm. games had to get come together and save the world. Uh, incredibly epic. Uh, we've been playing that weekly for, well, we've been playing with that group weekly for years now. Um, and I've DM'd a bunch of one shots, played in a lot of one shots, and I've ran like a couple short, when I say short, I mean like or sessions, a couple short campaigns, but really uh, beyond this one, I've been running a, a God, how long have we been playing this? Other, a, a campaign in Noir's world that started as a, as a one shot where Noir, you were like, yeah. I got to take this week off. And I said, hey, there's another side to this continent we've never mm -hmm. visited. Could I run a one shot there or a two shot really? I think I pitched as two sessions and you were like, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we did it and everyone had fun. And I said, and then there was another week you needed off. I said, you guys want to go again? I have a one shot prepared. You said, yeah, we did that. And then uh, we've just been playing that as a campaign and it's nearing its end. We've been off for a couple months with it, but yeah, because mm -hmm. uh, it's hard for me to prep two campaigns at the same time, but we're nearing its end now. It should be uh, like three sessions more, I think. But anyway, that's my entire gaming. Yeah. I've played a couple other games. I am an avid collector of uh, some RPGs that I've never gotten a chance to play, like Icarus and uh, Ten Candles and yeah. Blades in the Dark. Which are all super cool. Uh, I've got the Marvel RPG the, uh, test book sitting behind me right now. Mm -hmm. So there's tons of things I'd like to play someday, but yeah, so have not gotten a, a chance to. Of gaming oh yeah, champions for the, the different folks here on the podcast. Uh, but I think this mm -hmm. is really the only stream that most of us have been or streams the wrong word, but podcast oh, totally. most of us have been on uh, actual play. Actual yeah. play, yeah. AP, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> Although I am on a number of other podcasts. <laughs> my own design uh, <laughs> uh, i'll take a question from email this time this comes from uh our email it's to austin and sophia as we close season two mm -hmm. what's the status of the danny davian ship does danny actually have a crush on him or is that mostly oh. sophia and does davian even know that they're flirting yet <laughs> Where they okay. flirting? Um. it's mostly me i don't know if it's violently apparent <laughs> the episodes i'm like oh <laughs> A pathetic man <laughs> to mock relentless. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but it, I think it's fun to play it up because Danny, Danny likes to um, mess with people, and I think that the easiest way to mess with Davian has just been to flirt, <laughs> if it can be called that. <laughs> I, I don't know that it could be. <laughs> I might think it's flirting. This is, you're That's the thing, right? Is you guys, uh, we, we trash on Davian, but I think he's more, he's got a high charisma. I think he's more socially oh, yeah. versed than any, oh, yeah. maybe all of you put together. Sure. Yes, so, absolutely. Most likely. So I don't, I don't, look, I'm not going to speak to the future of it, but so far, I don't know that he's uh, necessarily <laughs> pining for Danny. I think it's more of a situation where he's, I, I can, know, he is a really where you, annoying you, person he has to deal you with. You guys are bullying him. Really You're good. bullying yes. that poor man who's it's, doing it's, his he, best. Yeah. He mostly understands what's happening, but also it's so mind-boggling that he <laughs> thinks that 
it can't possibly be right. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's just his stance right now. Well, I, I like have... Damien. I think he's fine. Well, I like me too. I love Damien, Damien. because he gives me a punching bag that I don't feel bad, bad about punching. Because so far, it's only mm. resulted in funny moments. And now Virla helps out too, so it's like a win-win. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can kind of hope imagine. Davian does get damseled in season three, and we have to go <laughs> Oh, the, I think I that can... could be a real bonding moment. That'd be amazing. That'd be amazing. Oh. Red, you're on to something. Oh, Captain Verla, you have come to save me, thank you, and thank you. it is Danny again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is that Austin taking notes in the background? Are you? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Oh. Okay, we'll take a question from the chat. This one comes from Villainous Preamble. How would the Hypnagogue encounter have fared if Kiana and Virla would have been able to dream? There seemed to be a sort of intended mm. interaction with mm. how Finbar dealt with it, but I, it was cut pre- preemptively. So Virla and Kiana couldn't Good dream, question. and so they didn't encounter the Hypnagogue in their mind palaces. But what uh, what do you guys think maybe your characters might have dreamed about, or how that encounter might have played differently if we did have to deal with that? whole situation yeah so my understanding of the hypnagogue is that it basically just kind of turned your nightmare into a canvas for unearthing trauma so (laughs) oh boy oh boy (laughs) (laughs) if that's the case then maybe virila would have been sad a lot sooner than episode seven uh is basically the long and short of it because virila basically Mm. is saying is you know he's in my memories and not to get too spooky for a minute but do you think there's a situation where like his nightmare is just nothing like it's just like a blank (laughs) you know oh yeah i mean the thing that verla isn't the quiet part that verla isn't saying out loud one of the quiet parts is that his perception of his crew his old crew so emerson caleb and all the others is an ideal he doesn't know what his crew is like he just knows that evoked this feeling in him there is entirely the possibility that he finds his crew and they're all assholes for some reason. Yeah. They just know. all suck. <laughs> but I think what a I, I, I think if 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 the hypnagogue wanted to toy with Virla, I think that might be a decent angle to go at. Just uh, you know, br- give him his give him his old crew back, but then twist it to be a either a true or a, a false demented. Uh, relationship between him and the rest of them yeah i can draw on the actual stress dreams i had about the finale of season one <laughs> um, <laughs> i'm I think so Kiana's... sorry i never meant to give you stress dreams <laughs> it was just because i was i was in the spotlight and i was worried that if i made the wrong decision everyone was gonna die so i feel like that's what it would absolutely be that kiana's stuck back in the monastery and she's lost in it and the corridors keep getting confusing and her crew shows oh, up to yeah. save her and then they all die um yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I hinted that too, because when, when we were actually finding the hypnagogue, there was still like, we didn't see the hypnagogue, it was like hallucinations still or whatever. So I was like, alright, what's a good place to take this? Alright, let's let's fuck up Virla's current crew. And so I was like, <laughs> yep. uh, Virla uh, sees like Danny with a bunch of Paragon arrows stuck in, or so good. Virla sees goals. Kiana in the midst of turning into a Mind Flayer. So. Yeah, that would have sucked. Yeah. Yeah. From a... Uh... Those are both. I, I just want to say, from a from a meta DM planning perspective, I read that monster and immediately my mind went to. Uh, so that monster is from an issue of Arcadia, which is the MCDM, uh, basically spiritual successor to the old Dragon Plus magazine. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's mm-hmm. extremely good. You can, if you subscribe to their Patreon, you can get it for seven fifty or ten dollars a month. I forget, but it's one of those two. Um, I find it to be extremely useful, not just in things I pull, but just in inspiring ideas. That's where the monster is from. It's a little, it's got a little bit of the, the homebrew uh, 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 feel to it, and it's kind of intended for an adventure, so I modified it a bit, but I totally kept the, um, it pulls on your dreams, and uh, yeah, that's, when I read that, basically the reason we use I used that monster is because I knew there'd be a super interesting interaction of two players unable to be affected by it, and two yeah. players able to be affected by it. Is there another encounter where everyone's affected and there's some other way out? Uh, Teen Titans, Raven, Nightmare style? Yeah. Definitely. But I thought the super interesting thing would be basically putting these two groups of players on opposite sides of a wall mm-hmm. and being yeah. like, and of course, then you put you, I had a note where I was like, actually, <laughs> Kiana can talk to them. And, <laughs> uh, and then you, you guys figured out a method of communication, but it was still super, super interesting. And yeah. uh, as for where the, someone, I think someone asked where the Hypnic God came from. Uh, it's, uh, it has no body. It's an astral parasite, um, uh, much like. Suvi originally it's an astral being that has no physical form and so it Yay. has to like it, it hitched a ride when they were in the astral sea and then was just like 
hanging on in a you know um in the astral overlay to where their ship was parked wait for them to go to sleep and then uh attack them so, so that's where it was it was uh there was nothing special about it they just sail on the astral sea a lot and it it stuck on like a barnacle well, gonna have to start whacking those things regular off ship maintenance hi i'm the mechanic yeah. of the paraspera <laughs> and i just like to say <laughs> that we don't fix it up enough <laughs> i think of like a just taking like a broom like walking yeah, around the outside whack. swatting stuff down uh, yeah yeah I think another question from the chat. This comes from Ruffed Grouse. Will Hans be making a return, and will there be any more guests? Uh, we do have plans to have more guests on in future episodes. We don't have anyone specifically locked in yet, so I'm not going to give you too much information away. Uh, but, you know, there's always a possibility that Hans could go back. Uh, he's a very high-level cleric, so who knows if we'll ever need those services. Uh, and I'd love to play with Lou again, so maybe someday. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of... Sure. It's <laughs> The answer about those questions is sort of just, yeah, it's totally possible. Um, yep. Austin, this also comes from the chat uh, from Seth Crino. What yes. is your method for balancing combat? Do you use uh, CR uh, challenge rating or some other means? The, the classic, classic question. Um, how do you make a fair com How do you balance a combat? Uh, the answer is, it's a lot of things, but to be pithy about it, uh, encounters shouldn't be balanced because it's not a war it's not a game of warhammer where everyone gets a certain amount of points to spend it's a real breathing world and some encounters are going to be trivial and some encounters are going to be really hard and i have to kind of strip out the trivial ones because we do an episodic format mm -hmm. where it's my job to maintain drama so the answer is it, it again to be sort of coy about it is that i don't really balance but yes i do use cr uh i think that People really hate on CR, and it's far from a perfect system. But what you have to remember is that CR is just... I just kind of... I assume whatever I've set is one step too... So if I make a medium encounter, I assume that's actually... Like, according to the rules, that's probably an easy encounter for them, right? Uh, because PCs are more competent than... the D Right? The PCs outnumber the DM, so they're always going to mm -hmm. think of good good stuff. Um, they So they have that power... They play their characters all the time. I'm playing this monster for probably four rounds of combat, so they are more powerful in that respect. And in general, most DMs, myself included, award more magic items than the game assumes, so they're more powerful in that respect. So I tend to make a deadly encounter a, a, that just bridges into deadly thinking it's hard, and so on. It's also just a case, and I don't think I have a good solution for this other than force it which is i've played a lot <laughs> i've seen how a lot of the monsters act and i read my I, i'm i'm one of those dms that knows the character sheets for my pcs really really well mm -hmm. so i know when certain features are going to have a interesting feedback loop or effect so for example if they're fighting a creature that is resistant to lightning and the CR takes that into account. I know that it's probably weaker than the CR says because I know that Virla ignores lightning damage and is able to deal out a ridiculous amount because he has lightning bolt. So uh, it's just a combination of those factors. But uh, And then also taking your foot off the gas and pushing it down when you need to. Uh, encounter design does not stop when you roll initiative. Encounter design is still going because they are running the alpha test for the encounter I wrote up more often than not, right? So encounter design has to ha has to happen. Um, I do I do have a trick that I use for helping encounters seem uh, to keep encounters dramatic and have a way of pushing down on the gas or easing up if I need to. It's not fudging dice rolls, uh, although I'm not morally against that. Um, I don't think you're a bad DM if you fudge dice rolls. I don't know mm -hmm. if I should say, though, because I feel like it's a little behind the DM. Maybe that's more of a Reddit question, maybe. If someone asks that on the Reddit, I can make it. <laughs> because uh, right. it's the sort of thing that I feel like it makes a lot of sense, but it's sort of like revealing where the magic trip, you know, where the rabbit comes from with the magic mm -hmm. trip, where you're both happy you know, and then also sad you know. So, yeah. Okay. Anyway, that was my long-winded response. <laughs> All right, this question came to us from our email from Taylor, a uh, server member. Uh, <laughs> Wally, what does the golden acorn do that you commissioned? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so, uh, this, yes, this kind of ties into uh, one of the other questions uh, that I saw in the chat uh, of doesn't Finbar have a pet wolf? 
uh, that he does, and that's what, what the acorn is for. That's what the acorn um, is for. So uh, at some point when we do get back to the city of brass, uh, I will get that acorn. And um, we've seen Wolfbar, you know, he transforms into a wolf um, right. and pays homage to um, his pet wolf, which, you know, he got at some point in his life. I have not articulated the backstory for when and how, but uh, he does have a pet wolf. And that's what the acorn is for. Ooh. Where is it in the Feywild? Is it at home? Have uh, you just been flying with a wolf all this whole time and <laughs> <laughs> no one has opened the quarters that technically should be the captain's quarters he's just yeah, <laughs> yeah he's <laughs> missing it scooby-doo style he's been yeah, the captain yeah. all along guys <gasps> <laughs> uh but from the same user uh for red and indigo if your pc has a wish spell what would they use it for oh boy uh, no just giving it away mm. so if kiana had to make the wish or danny had to make the wish what would they have wished for I I really feel like Kiana would sit on it as long as possible if necessary because for her it's like I gotta like this is a thing that could save people but I don't need to save them right now so I'll use it when I do need to. Um, it should be so dramatic. That's pretty yeah, smart. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because there's always right there's always a worse scenario that the yeah, wish exactly. for. I think she would like if anyone died that's what she'd use it for. Um, yeah. That's true. I don't think that Kiana really sense. has a deep understanding of what magic is generally capable of. Um, so. <laughs> If it's like, oh, this can basically do anything, she'll be like, wow, that's crazy. It's super powerful. And then if something bad happens, she's like, oh, no, okay, we got to use it right now, even if there's other spells for it. Um, I like the idea that Danny uh, fully understands, like, the gravity of what a wish can do and chooses to use it for something silly and dumb that she could probably just do herself, <laughs> yes. but wants to save her the time. Probably like, bad. put in, like, a turbo boost button on the ship or something like that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, or maybe you know, something wider scale, um, turning the temperature of the universe up. Oh, two ships. <laughs> oh, no. Not one ship, but two ships. Danny just asked for an exact <laughs> it all comes back to animated, yeah. for Aspera. <laughs> yep. <laughs> for Aspera 2. And then we swap it out. We give Otto one of them and we just have the other. Uh... <laughs> if there is a ship, I will fly it. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I think for Danny, at least, like, there's uh nothing so grand or inaccessible that she longs for that i think she would need the wish for and so i see her kind of flying in the face of conventional conventional wishdom and uh just using it for something silly to just get it out of her hands and out of her hair um <laughs> i'll take questions from the chat uh well let's do wait did wally answer uh was uh, yeah. well, indigo, but wally what would you have used yeah for? I mean, Finbar has already answered that. He has no need for a wish. He, at any given point, has everything he needs. Um, and he's very content, um, for the most part. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> I do want to say, obviously I have no PC to make the wish, but uh, at the end of last uh, season, I think I said, I, I think I tweeted too, I said that when... Uh, when I pitched the show and Sophia and I decided it was going to happen and we were talking to people, I wrote down a list of ideas for episodes and then I, I wrote them down in order, eight episodes, and I said that there were all, seven of those happened basically in the order I expected, which completely surprised me because halfway through the season I thought I was going to have to pivot and then suddenly I pivoted back. Uh, but I redacted one episode and that episode was, uh, I, I wrote down Contest for the Ginny's Favor and oh. that was so from day one i've known yeah. that there was going to be the competition for the wish uh but oh. ultimately one episode four ended up being kind of two parts and working out a lot better uh, but then also i knew that it was going to have to be a much bigger deal but yeah from day one i knew that this was gonna th this was going to be something that happened oh, Dang, man. Oh, so many wishes to be made <laughs> oh man i uh, will take a question from the but it's empty now Hmm. You got yeah. one. Now. Well, now we've got the attention of Mistra 2.0 because we already overclocked the ship <laughs> to get her attention the first time. It was such a good idea. And I think we also might have been on the Lady of Pain's radar. Yeah. Uh, the, hey, she, she pulled you into question, another little demi plane. Um, We're fine. In the email yeah, yeah. Yes. to Austin about how long Virla might have before the lady shows up. Uh, <laughs> starting Instantaneous. Out it's going to happen. <laughs> well, let's. <laughs> I think people somewhat misjudge the Lady of Pain's intentions. She's really, really, really hands-off. Hmm. Her main... 
a, a wish being used is definitely of interest, but, uh, you know, it wouldn't be the first time someone had wished in. Because the main use of a wish is just to replicate a spell of 8th level or lower. That's the main mm -hmm. use of it. So people have wished in Sigil a tons of times. It hasn't been a big deal. And Virila did make a contract with Mistra, um, but did not pull her there. They're at the end of the season, they're meeting on the Astral Sea. She has gone to the Astral Sea, the neutral zone, and pulled his soul there. So definitely there's a gray area that's been entered where she has interfered with someone on Sigil, which is a no-no. But she's not there, so uh, the Lady of Pain's not going to show up to, like, scour their flesh from their bones, which is what she typically does when people mm. bother her. No flesh to scour. Will, the, will, there, be no, will, there, be no, <laughs> will there be no consequences? I mean, we'll see. But I think people are assuming that the Lady of Pain is going to, like, show up and burn the ship to a crisp, and uh, that's not really... That, she, she, She's not there. You're going to come, like, kill people. But not that big a transgression has been made. Chat needs to know that I am absolutely ecstatic for this to bite us in the ass because right now, nobody <laughs> else in the crew knows it that will. this has happened. Yeah. And I want yeah. to know when we find out. I know. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, that, that's, that's, we, we did, like, a, a post-season two just wrap-up meeting, like, just between mm -hmm. the five of us and whatever. A good chunk of that time was spent on me <laughs> voicing how i'm probably like Vila will Vila would want to keep this as secret as possible for for the long amount of time for for reasons to him also a decent amount of time was spent uh listing increasingly more gruesome uh like endings to Virla's arc, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. In, in theories about what happened to the like crew. That. I think, yeah, like what happened to the I think crew. almost everyone was gone by then. I think it was just it was just it was, it was, it was, it was just it was me in the Discord call. I was just like, <laughs> oh, what if, what if he finds them alive, but then there's a huge combat and then they die in front of his eyes. <laughs> no more um, real, um... <laughs> Noir, every time mm. we have a conversation about, like, the direction of this podcast and of Virla specifically, it's like, oh, well, we could ruin his life. I think that'd be fun. <laughs> I think that'd be fun. I, I think uh... it is narratively interesting to <laughs> fuck up his life because because it is it, it, it is satisfying to see him climb back out of it, basically. Yeah. So, my so personal, the deeper he falls, uh... the, the higher he ends up at the end. So My nightmare up. theory was that uh, when the gang evacuated the ship, they took some of Virla's data spheres with them to save him, and now there's another Virla running yeah, around with the other that, crew, that was and an they don't know. Amazing one, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, Virla. Yeah, yeah. Two I Viralas. think that would be absolutely brutal. <laughs> um, uh, the the other on the other quiet thing that Virla is refusing to say out loud is at the end of it, if he does find his crew, he's gonna have to make a choice between the two of them. He doesn't really want to think about that right now. No. So. Oh, I'll take man. a question from the chat next. This comes from Break Fate's Chain. Question. Danny seems to be carrying a huge amount of guilt over Egan's death. How is Danny actually feeling about yeah. everything with what's happened? Uh, I mean, she's bummed. You know? <laughs> not, not <to> <laughs> no. Show. It is so funny to me that everyone in the fan base is like, Danny is such a deep and complex character. And you're like, no, she's not. <laughs> I think well, you know, every it, time oh. with Danny is, I think, in a weird way, she's... um kind of the most mundane of everyone in the crew so far like finbar is probably the next closest equivalent where like she doesn't have a grand plane hopping aspiration or like backstory to unravel she doesn't come from a particularly unusual upbringing uh she was working like a nine to five non-union gig <laughs> <laughs> and now she does this um and so, you know, the Heap and its employees, which I've spent a little time with Austin fleshing out a little bit more than I had originally uh, started at the beginning of this campaign, uh, in my mind, are Danny's closest equivalent to family prior to working with the Paraspora crew. Um, so she's bummed is probably you know, too light of a word. She's sad about Egan's passing, but she's pragmatic. So at the end of the day, like, it's not something she can do anything about. Um, she's mad that it happened. Uh but she's got to keep moving forward. So I think in her mind, it's sort of like, yeah, I'm pissed and sad about this, but I can't slap a Band-Aid on it. So I got to just keep being Danny going forward. Um, hmm. Yeah. But Seriously, if I, if, uh, if I may gush for a moment, I sure. the practice is so interesting because you say Danny's not that deep. I think Dan, it's yes and no. There's, yeah. uh, I think there's something very fascinating about Danny and it's exemplified twice or you mm -hmm. and i thought about this it's mm -hmm. happened twice in the season where um i think it's very normal for dnd care for pcs to be extremely uh introspective to be extremely um 
cautious about making choices because they're very risk averse, right? So that mm -hmm. tends to lead to a lot of, of avoiding making tough decisions, which is natural. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's the job of the DM to put tough decisions on your plate. But there's something very interesting about Danny where Danny does not shy away from making those. And it happened with the solution to stranger where mm -hmm. I had, um, I don't prep solutions for my problems because that's a great way to lock yourself in a box where your players can't figure it out. But it's mm -hmm. always a good idea to have some ideas in case your players really are scrambling and you need to drop little breadcrumbs. So I had had thoughts, how do you deal? Obviously they could have fought Stranger, which would have been very hard, unless they could have gotten Lula in, and then Lula probably would have uh, smoked his ass, because Lula's super powerful. <laughs> but, um, uh, which would have been super cool, actually, like a fight that's not to the death, but like, can we get this ally? Anyway, uh, I thought about, well, Virla is... Um, Virla is very intelligent. Virla might try to figure out what happened to Stranger. Virla is, Virla is, a, Virla is a conspiracy question solver. Mm -hmm. uh, Kiana is very empathetic. Kiana might try to feel for, um, to feel for a uh, stranger. Finbar is very supportive. Finbar might try to support and like provide comfort to Stranger. He's a huge comforting figure. Um, those are things that I had written down. And then Danny was just like, nope, can't deal with this. Let's put a slap job, like, you know, just put a patch on this <laughs> thing and walk away from it. Not a whole, yep. yeah. and just immediately, I was completely blown away. I think I had more inspiration for it, <laughs> uh, which you immediately yeah. used. Cause it was, it was hard. It wasn't an easy thing to do, but yeah. uh, the solution was so elegant. And then again, when you guys were all debating these very valid points about mm -hmm. Elise's uh, feelings for the wish and her her difficulty in letting go of Cardamon, you guys all came with extremely well thought and characterful uh, points of view. You're especially blown me away with um, how like and thinking like being like at least is right, uh, and then Danny coming and saying, "Yeah, we don't really have time for this navel gazing thing, though. Like none of you are necessarily <laughs> right, none of you are necessarily wrong on everything, but we do need to solve this problem." And I think mm -hmm. that speaks to Danny so much as a character, not to not to speak too much for your no, character, please. Sophia, but uh, I was like, I'm totally blown away by Danny's ability to just consistently want to see things done, um, mm -hmm. which is super, super interesting. Also, not to unseparate the artist from the art, but I also know for a fact that a lot of your motivation is we can't let this thing run over four hours again. <laughs> yeah, Out of yeah, my way! Yeah. yeah. Well, Both is, instances yeah. happened like right at the end of the episode. So. Considering you're character and player, I think, in some way. Yeah. It, Danny's it, also highly yeah. efficient. Danny's highly efficient. But, you and know, I'm producing the episode as you play it. So there is a bit of me that's like, how can I, you know, maintain the story but move this along? But I do think that, like, Danny as a character, um, has the sort of attitude of like you only have what you can fix and maintain so if a problem pops up she's immediately trying to find a solution for it because otherwise she might lose that thing or that person uh mm. which i that's mm. my internal justification for what usually manifests more of like oh my god we're at the four and a half hour mark sophia we gotta wrap this thing <laughs> <laughs> uh give him a boomerang we'll get out of here <laughs> yep <laughs> enforced yeah. method acting exactly exactly mm. Yeah. More questions. More it's questions. Good. More questions. <laughs> more Stop questions. chanting that. I'm reading. <laughs> uh, Let's take a question from the email. Uh, this one. Uh, yep. Uh, I know sometimes characters change once you finally get them to get to have them interact with their characters in the world. In the break between seasons, did any of you add more details to your character's backstory or tweak something which was already there? Um, hmm. I know I fleshed out a bunch of the NPCs at the heap a lot more between seasons one and two. Did anyone else do any sort of like backstory alterations in that downtime? I can do the easy no answer. Uh, Kiana's backstory <laughs> is very much a black box for me, and that's how I like it. Uh, I felt kind of bad when uh, Austin and I were initially coming up with the character because I was like, yeah, I think she works like uh, she she's part of like a secret monastery and she has no idea what they do there. <laughs> and Austin was like, great. All right. I'll go write this up for two days and get back to you. Um, that was fun, though. It was a fun challenge. Yeah, well, I, I like donning the code of plot hooks uh, because it, it means I need to make less decisions about what my character does. <laughs> yeah, kind of in a similar vein. Uh, again, uh, I, I was starting my first year of grad school when we were kind of in the process of starting this. I was like, I don't have time for a backstory. Let's do the amnesia round. So the DM yeah. has to do all the work. Uh, <laughs> since since then, though, like Austin has has laid the ground for very for like, a very interesting character. Um, I don't think Viral has done any. I don't. I haven't. I have not done anything to tweak Virla's backstory because how could I? I don't know it. Um, but Virla in the eight months and then continuing has kind of 
formed his own thoughts about how his the place in the crew old crew was so like um when i i sent this to austin uh I, I i wrote out the the mr monologue or whatever and i basically annotated it with like here's what Viral is saying and why he's saying it here's his justification yada 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 um for every name that Virla had listed in the old crew i also listed what Virla was like his perception of who that was and it's based off of nothing it's like the name mm -hmm. is, is literally all that it is it, Virla could be absolutely wrong um but I think it's interesting that he is kind of a lot indulging himself in thinking about how his life with his old crew was like, uh, which, in my opinion, sets him up for a harder fall when he sees the true reality <laughs> of it. Always Who knows? Back around to how hard can Noir make the character of Yurla fall so that he can rise? I mean, a lot of us are playing. He's... Yeah. <laughs> Well, a lot of us are playing time bombs in different ways, but Virla is definitely <laughs> the angst bomb in the crew. Yeah. yeah. If Kiana yeah. is the coat of plot hooks, Virla is the coat of, yeah. like, angsty moments. Like, tears in the rain, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. He's just waiting Kiana's for Kiana's off it, having, like, a chosen one arc. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Virla's in his own little noir off in the corner. Uh, it was just that meme of like the the three shots of the guy on the beach looking extremely despondent in various <laughs> ways. You know the one I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just the the, the screensaver that plays in Virla's brain when he yeah. sleeps, quote unquote. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I always imagine the yeah. screensaver in Virla's brain was just like, you know, like the way the box bounces around the screen and you try and watch. I was literally <laughs> just thinking the same thing. Every, every time it hits the corn, he just like wakes up and is like, woohoo, and then goes yeah. back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, God. Yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, Wally, what about oh. Finbar? Yeah. Um, yeah. So Finbar, I didn't really have much to do going into season three. Austin had like a two page backstory to work off of. And I had already given him ideas for like, I really wanted to do uh, that, uh, that gift gifting, gift giving episode. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yes. you know, exploring the searing tongue um, was fun. Um, and uh, it, it was strange uh, having Finbar be the focus of uh, season two. Uh, I think uh, everyone else here has a, a lot of uh, time, uh, really like performance in it in terms of improv. And I'm very quiet. So in terms of being the, the focus of the episode, it was nerve wracking at times. But uh, it was fun um, having Finbar uh, take the spotlight for a little Bit. Um, going into season three, though, uh, Austin does have a list of uh, Finbar's exes. What he chooses to do with those um, is destiny. entirely up to him. Um, but I'm going to enjoy <laughs> going back into the background and being uh, a little more supportive um, and, you know, doing things to patch things up with Elise because uh, that's just getting started. We're, get, we're so primed for like a Scott Pilgrim one shot of just Finbar's seven <laughs> exes. And I just feel like, you yeah. know, we've been sleeping on that a little bit, but <laughs> it's yeah. right there. Uh, we realize that Finbar's in the middle of a JRPG, and he's done, <laughs> he's done all of. It's like Stardew Valley, where you where you romance all of the people, but then yeah. when you get max romance with all of them, they like realize and unless then you have you a get, they fight each other. Okay, unless you have a rabbit's foot. Is that a thing? Uh, yeah. Is a thing. yeah, 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 oh yeah. My God. Get on this. Get on my Stardew level, Austin. Uh, but we'll take another question from the chat. This one comes from Trevor to Indigo. You mentioned you edit the audio, but is that limited to dice rolls? So I do edit the podcast audio. It is not presented exactly as you hear it, with the exception of these Q and A's, because these were live streams first. Um, yeah. I mostly try to cut out things like silence, spaces, or if someone needs to like take a bathroom break in the middle of the episode, or like dice rolls sometimes, because D and D is a lot of fun to play, uh, but it can kind of run long to listen to so I'm, I'm trying to turn mm. episodes to make them a more enjoyable listening experience uh i usually try not to cut content if i can help it if we get into like a little tangent that is completely unrelated to the game or the podcast and like if you know, i don't know we start talking about some media property for and that goes for like a few minutes too long i might cut that <laughs> out uh, but generally there's not too much that's like removed from any given episode uh other than that dead air. But that said, that I still cut like nearly 45 minutes of like dead air and dice rolls and silences. So it's pretty heavily edited, but I, I, most of the content you guys are, are getting uh, on any given episode is just cut to make it flow a little nicer. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, good. Fun stuff. Love editing these. Uh, it's a blast. Uh, I also get to know what everyone's cats sound like or <laughs> red's chain huh. case, a really squeaky stool. <laughs> You're lucky I'm not demonstrating right now. <laughs> the temptation flashed in my mind like a button prompt. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, this other another question coming from the chat. Ha <laughs> ha Um, during this comes from Yukirashi. During the fancy dress shopping montage, what song was playing in each of your heads? Uh, back in what was it episode <laughs> two? We two. had to go buy dresses and suits and things. Oh, yeah. What what were you and your your character listening to in your head in that moment while you were out dress shopping or you know thrifting or whatever it was? Huh. I'm walking on sunshine. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's just, just that on a loop, basically. I'll be honest, that's not that's just not how my brain works. I don't control what background noise is yeah. playing at any <laughs> at any time. But I feel like just because it got lodged in my head after it featured in a brief bit in Sandman, it's uh it's Skeletons in Your Closet by Brothers Osmond, I wanna say. Mm. Uh which absolutely slaps and it's got a really good beat to walk through. Uh, and because my uh, dress shopping consisted of finding the same outfit but in a slightly different color, <laughs> I think that's fair. Yeah, Danny was at a thrift yeah, shop. That's what so happens I when you me. ask me to describe I, uh, uh, dress uh, uh, yeah. clothing. Yeah, athleisure ball wear. Yeah, I know Danny went thrifting, so I, I imagine that what she was hearing was just like... Uh, off key cover of the girl from Ipanina so that it was royalty free and that they could be like play in that <laughs> thrift store. Um, <laughs> and I do kind of love that as being the backing track because, again, very pragmatic character. She's just here to get in, get out, get what she needs. Uh, and I rolled super low. <laughs> 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 that dress. Or, like, or like Spanish Fleet or something. Yeah, yeah, you know, like elevator music. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I do think Danny's actual like hype song, though, would be something closer to like punk tactics or how they like me now or anything that was on the danny play oh yeah. yeah i feel like it has to be something really 80s though like that's that's kind that's of the, the vibe i get girls just want to oh it was girls just want to have fun i don't know oh, there you go. Go. oh there you go <laughs> just, it's just a montage of com danny's coming out of the dressing room at their shop in like a series of awful 80s dresses <laughs> some of them are themed differently oh yeah yeah, yeah. um what about Finbar? I guess you already had your uniform, but still, what was playing? Uh, yeah, no, that's the thing. Uh, Finbar didn't really have to do any uh, shopping, but if he's hanging out with um, Elise, nine times out of ten, it's like old Motown um, songs, uh, Ain't No Mountain High Enough or ABCs. Like, that's nice. uh, for him. Uh, that's always getting him in the mood for a party. Uh, hell yeah. Uh, I realized I just mentioned it, but we did make, in between seasons one and two, we made uh, character playlists. They're all available on Twitter. Uh, if you scroll back a little bit, maybe I'll uh, retweet them later tonight. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think someone might have even made them into actual, actual playlists, playlists. on Spotify oh, or yeah. YouTube. Yeah. So if, the, if you're that person and you're listening, please tweet it <laughs> again so we can find it. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, alrighty. Oh, excuse me. Uh, who's doing this live? <laughs> New question, new question, new question. <laughs> question. The pressure no. is on. Oh my god, <laughs> I had to make a decision so quickly. Uh, 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 actually scrolling and reading is so hard. Um, do, 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 boom, boom, boom. <laughs> I mean, if you're, I, um, to Daniel, to Daniel Graham, uh, to whom it may concern, I know you guys are a bit scattered, but would you say, uh, what would you say are the chances of an in-person one-shot or God forbid campaign? Um, we are extremely scattered yeah. between yeah. several different states yeah. and cities. So uh, some of us are going to see other people soon. I don't know if there's a chance of a in-person game mm -hmm. anytime soon, but obviously that's always the dream, right? Yeah, that could yeah. be cool. Yeah, maybe someday. I don't know if it'll happen for this show anytime particularly soon, just because how we uh, how we record it and um, mm -hmm. all of our locations. But uh, hopefully someday the gang will all sit around at the table and roll some dice. And won't that be nice? That's been, that's been the wish since 2020, let's uh, be honest. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, this question from chat comes from Mercurial. Question from my brother. Will Austin count Leland, Leland as a sword that deals slashing damage for the purpose of being made into a vorpal blade in the, with the Arendor ore mm -hmm. that the crew got in episode 8? Mm -hmm. uh, love that we got all that loot, and can we use it to make yes. a vorpal blade for Yes. You guys got very loot, very little loot this season, and then I put a whole bunch of stuff in there, which was an investigation check, and I think I think really got it all, because I think you yeah. cracked at 25 or 26 or whatever the DC was to get it. Yeah. All. So, uh, Yes, Lylin, Leyland, sorry, so it's Leyland the Waning Blade, mm -hmm. and uh, which was a gift from Hundkiln to Finbar when he became a hunter or when he returned, I forget. But uh, it does deal slashing damage. It's a it's a scimitar, so yep. it is eligible. 
It's a sickle. Adding, it's a sickle. There you go. So adding more than one enchantment to magic items is tricky, but it's not impossible. So if they were to do it, there might be either he could pay someone a hefty sum, which is what he did for his armor as well, uh, or uh, he there might be some sort of skill challenge. Danny is an artificer and skilled at making magic items after all. So whatever path they decide to go for that, uh, Lalin definitely does qualify. And uh, it also could be made into armor, though, to resist force damage. And I believe it makes you immune to magic missile, too, if you're wearing armor made cool. out of it. So, mm-hmm. so uh, that is super cool. That's something I pulled from... Uh, like a 3.5 book or something like that. that it sounds uh, 3.5, yeah. That just was recommended to me, and there's like just a bunch of gems and metals in there that are cool. And I was like, this seems cool. Yeah, let's awesome. throw a chunk of that in there. Heck yeah. yeah. Uh, this question from the chat comes from Sierra D. Did you ever release what Noir was saying in the Discord alone <laughs> during the nightmare scene? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah, so we didn't yes, put it dish. up, but um, Noir... I believe you recited the entirety of Act One, and Scene One of Romeo and Juliet. I didn't get very far. I basically got right up until like the policeman guy came in and started breaking up the jets and the sharks. But yes, uh, <laughs> I was really bored, uh, and so I was just like, "What can I do?" <laughs> Two households, both alike in dignity and fair yep. yada yada yada. It was I didn't. Uh, it was just something to make Sophia laugh while she was editing. I uh, it didn't did, expect. It made me giggle. You got me. You yeah. got me, Noir. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, what I'm here for. It's what I, it's all I live for. Everyone's approval. Single brain cell, Constantly. one brain cell duo. <laughs> so yeah, that's yeah. the power that we hold. Um, yeah. Super positioning. This question from chat comes from Candy Bar. Uh, in an alternate timeline version of your characters, uh, they're a different <laughs> class. What inciting incident changes yes! their fate, and what is the class that they <laughs> are in? <this> day? <laughs> yes. Oh. Oh. Tell me. Huh. Uh, oh, easy. Oh, I got this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, Wally, it's please. also easy for me, but you go first. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I'm not playing a ranger or um, uh, uh, or a wizard, uh, I, I like to play warlock. Um, so mm. uh, Finbar would easily be a celestial warlock. Um, very similar niche, uh, completely different tempo and play style. And obviously, I'd have to think of something juicy for whatever pact with whatever deity he chose. Um, but yes, celestial warlock. Yes. Lush or Warlock, very, very cool. Yeah. What, what, would, on what would lead yeah. Finbar to taking that on? I, oof. Um, let's see. Probably the aforementioned juicy backstory thing. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you did. I, I was stranded. Up, but yeah, you were stranded sea in the Astral Sea, which is where the gods, that's like the closest you can get to any gods at any time without being in their actual domain. So, so something finds you or senses you and reaches something, out. Mm, yep. Yeah, he, Finbar could have called out to the cosmos for aid and... Uh, a lot of times devils answer those, but it's also possible for mm-hmm. God to answer. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, That's cool. Mine is kind of determined by uh, whatever the Mind Flayer's pet project of the day was. Uh, so presumably if they were like, we should try paladins this time, it would have been a paladin thing or like, <laughs> you know, something where they don't do all that much thinking, but do do a lot of hitting. So pretty much any of the core combat classes would have been easy. They probably wouldn't want spellcasters because those guys are a little too smart. Um, and I know that now that paladins aren't at all affiliated with gods, you could do some kind of sneaky mind flayer paladin order thing. That just feels like the yeah, it's sort of the, the second easiest of thing. The watchers, where it's like we're against all sort of aberrations and uh, yeah, just as long as it's not that one, should yeah. be fine. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, the mind flayer's greatest flaw is their hubris. So yep. It would be very funny if they actively curated an order specifically devoted to destroying yeah. them. Yeah. They were like, this mm-hmm. will... done it several times. This will never find <laughs> us in the gas. That's, that's, the yeah. that's exactly yeah. what the gifts are. Yes, and you're correct. Yeah. Right. The came, but it's, yeah. I would think, if anything, it might be there are Psy, uh, the Psy Knight and the, uh, the Phant- is it the Phantom Knight? Or what's the, what's the rogue that also uses psionic dice? Is it, mm. so, it's, I think it's the Soul, soul Knight. Soul Knight. Yes. So the Psy Knight or the Soul Knight are both also psionic classes. And since they were, uh, you know, uh, cultivating psionic energy, it's possible that to, avo- like you said, uh, to avoid spellcasters, <laughs> but uh, to have, you know, warriors that are training that cyanide or, or the soul knife uh, would have been yep. mm-hmm. good options. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think Danny also has like a pretty easy answer because she grew up on the streets of the city of Brass and as we've riffed in Riff Raff Street Rat many times, if she hadn't started working in the heap, she probably would have just gone full rogue, right? You know? Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Learning the streets. Very dope. <laughs> this 
sort of destroys the conceit of the podcast, but if Birla did not lose his crew and he just kept <laughs> sailing with them, I imagine that he would extend his learning into a lot of different other skills, instruments, and, <laughs> and so. this, is, this is my justification for playing a bard, which <laughs> who, who I usually play uh yeah, bars and rogues but I don't know yeah how we managed to get both of us onto one campaign and neither of us ended up playing a bar well i wanted it's i wanted to do something different we want we wanted to do something different you know uh, awesome well kind yeah. of related to talking about classes uh from jish in the chat uh is anyone else thinking of multi-classing or would wally take on a third class <laughs> um i don't think danny's gonna multi-class i think she's pretty solidly just gonna dig into those artificer levels um Unless something dramatic we'll see. happens. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. We'll see. Uh, yeah. uh, triple class would be a bit much. I have done the math on it. Um, the most uh, likely would be um, a life cleric, uh, just to you know push the healing uh, a little further. But uh, I've done. He's sticking ranger druid up until twenty. I have every single le level planned out. Oh, oh my god! Um, it would be crazy if we made I. Oh. DM impulse to just make it make everyone level up fast so that you can fight fucking Sith Rihanna or the Eater of Worlds Final or boss. whatever. Oh, like, oh please do. <laughs> yeah. Actually, go to Zugut Moy's. Go for distance. Yeah. I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is not related. I just can't get over how good of an NPC like a twentieth level Danny would be in some future campaign. <laughs> just oh, minding yeah. her own fucking business, running her own scrapyard or whatever, just, just has, casually with the power. Old. Gods, old top, she, but in like the second layer of Acheron or something. Yeah, yeah, but no. also just like like minding her own business, just like seems like a really savvy businessman, auto style, and then like yeah. some shit goes down, and she's like, okay, and just like whips uh, out the cannon. Yeah. Danny would have level twenty adventurer retired owns the tavern. Yeah, Danny exactly. would have found that um, mind flayer dreadnought. Uh, taken it, fused that with the Paraspora, yeah. somehow <laughs> made that like a junkyard as well, just and just would have been flying around the actual sea. Like, yeah. yeah. I think Star whatever Destroyer, building she's in is a, a spell jammer. On top <laughs> it's like yeah. the only good scene of Valerian, which is the first one where, where, where yep. the, yep. the city yep. of planets is, is yep. just a bunch it's of yeah. like it's just a bunch of spell jammers like mashed together and that's what I think Danny has her own demi plane and people are like it's got to be like the corpse of a god under there or something and it's just all these spell jammers <laughs> nope, chained just, together yeah, just spell jammers when she needs one down. she just undocks it and leaves yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um Virla, when we were when we were living when when we were leveling up to level 8 i was like Virla's really protective of his friends and his old crew can i make like a paladin thing work or something like that <laughs> uh verla does not have the charisma to do paladin unfortunately he does not meet that requirement uh and i don't i haven't really this is purely narrative so i don't i haven't even i've looked even less into this but depending on how his relationship with mister goes morlock maybe Ooh. Um, something that yeah. can just continue on we'll see yeah i think something that's cool is that uh for those of us who haven't multiclassed yet, it's kind of like a. It seems like everyone's kind of on the same page. Like I don't know if something narrative came up, maybe I would do it. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't. Know oh, I've got an idea. I just don't want to spoil it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, fine. It's, yeah. We'll just move so, on. Yeah, we'll, we'll get around to that one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, this question from chat comes from Great Dymo Reeks. Do you guys have any extra trivia about your characters that hasn't come up? For example, Danny uh, mm. with the soda or Virla's plug allergy. Is there any like little? bit of lore you've decided on for your character that you just haven't had a chance to drop in the show no <laughs> pretty <laughs> solid blank slate uh i did mention something that happened in session zero but it's mostly been kind of glossed over uh but i was having weird dreams with like space whales in them and i haven't seen any <laughs> space whales since entering the astral sea and i'm kind of like where are the fucking whales so <laughs> didn't we see one didn't we see one early on i, I think, think we might have I think what happened was that when you in session zero or your your, your solo session mm -hmm. or maybe it was in session zero when you were treading water you saw one swim by oh i did so okay I think, but now i'm just like where are the i, I do the love whales? this i do love the space whales there's actually stat blocks for them in the new um, <gasps> the new book so yes, space yes, whales are out there uh, yeah. i don't like to reveal too much about the things that the characters would know but Astral space whales fishing. they exist they're out there yes no no fishing Stop if that. you roll a nat 20 on the astral fishing you get a whale there's a chart for astral fishing too it's like mm -hmm. a Nothing. random encounter chart the last thing this goddamn campaign needs is one more chart. <laughs> <laughs> um i'll be the judge of that i i texted this to austin during 
the session of the madness thing, uh, Virla is really good at drawing, but they're like scientific drawings where it's like kind of that very specific very cool. like pencil detail yes. with like the crosshat shading kind of deal. Love um, it. That's that's how that's that's what he uses for his conspiracy boards, basically. When it's like, oh, mind flare, get Zera. Oh, uh, let me <laughs> let me sketch this, yada yada. Um, the the thing that I was texting Austin was that he got so far into his madness personally that he started putting up conspiracy board um, about the, the the portal, or he was adding it to his Zukmoy one. He also added a line with Danny, Kiana, and Finbar, but he couldn't necessarily draw their faces because all he could do is kind of scribble in like a really demented in like smiley face or something like that. So, there's that. <laughs> no. The Danny Soda thing, uh, I actually told, I think I texted it to Austin at like 2am like a month before we started recording <laughs> season one. Like, oh, you know what would be really funny is if Danny got her name from like a brand of soda because, you know, she's living, she doesn't know her family or anything she wouldn't have an, she just picked her name for herself uh i think you said yeah. okay and then uh forgot about it until finally went to the city yeah the and it yeah <laughs> dropped in all of its glory <laughs> so it just sort of lurked in the background um most of the other stuff i've got for danny floating around are just more about the npcs at the heap who we haven't really had too much time to meet yet um i like the idea that her egan and roy the two other fire genasi mechanics uh are like kind of like a trio of miscreants um but, or um, like a trio of miscreants. Hey, or hey. like a trio of miscreants. Uh, <laughs> Oof, rip. Oof. Um, this is the worst day of my life. <laughs> <are. laughs> um, yeah, but I think more of that will be fun to see play out uh, in seasons three and four. So I'll, I don't know if I want to get too deep into any of that just this second. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of the Finbar lore has already been out there. Um, but uh, technically, he wasn't particularly good at school. Like, he went to the academy, became a chef and all that. He could do the the cooking. Uh, but in terms of, like, the actual book work and homework, he had the, the fairies and Elise kind of help him, uh, you know, push oh. him along the way. Um, and also, he was just very nice uh, at school. So everyone's like, it's okay, Finbar. You, you did your best uh, on this test, but we know you can cook. So, you know, we'll move oh. you along. Oh. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Um, awesome. This question from chat comes from Trevor. Uh, so if Kiana gets a pet, what would it be? Virla has docent, Danny has plug, and Finbar has a wolf, apparently. But what would Kiana get? <laughs> <laughs> so Kiana, build, uh, Red, build your own weird little dude. Who do, what do you want? Oh man, I here's the thing. This is this is showing both mine and Kiana's ignorance because I know there are many wonderful weird little dudes out there in the planescape, and of course my my raison d'être is basically seeing all of them. So I feel like the first one I find that's even slightly like friendly and like orphaned is <laughs> is getting adopted. Doesn't matter what it is. I have a pitch for you. Got and, space. You know, well, yeah, it being like some like. Some larval version <laughs> of some horrible thing, uh, or or oh, like like a like a super baby version of like something that would, like something from the Beast Lands that would grow to be twenty feet tall. Okay, <laughs> okay, hear me out. There yeah. are dinosaurs in the Beast Lands. That's where they're. From. There are dinosaurs. Yes. Kiana with a raptor. I thought we'd fight. Very some funny. Um, Tiny raptor, but like like a like an actually accurate raptor. So it basically oh, it looks like a weird small bird like with like a toe claw. Um, or uh, thirty two <laughs> velociraptors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or we could Kim possible this, and you can get a giant space uh, miniature giant space hamster that could yeah, just, like, there you go in the monk robes. <laughs> so you just that would be yeah. pretty cute. Miniature <laughs> oh, giant no. space hamsters have an ability called go for the eyes. <laughs> What? Yeah, where they can try to blind opponents. That's, it's a, so it's a running funny. joke from the Baldur's Gate lore. It's not important, but yep. yes, uh, that's where it's, uh, it's but a yes, thing. I definitely think a baby version of something that will like live for a thousand years and become nightmarishly enormous and terrifying. Baby uh, Terrasque. Baby Terrasque. I'll take a baby Terrasque <sighs> if nobody tells me no. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, this next question from the chat comes from Luchable. Uh, last shot asking today, Austin, is it possible for two different roles to have the same wild magic result? See Danny getting blued with a 23 and a 24. Uh, I believe... <laughs> oh, yeah. It, it's Good. Good. You guys question. haven't looked at the chart? The chart is uh, 50 uh, different yeah. things, not uh, 100. So every two uh, numbers is, a, is the same effect. So uh, she did not roll the same number twice, but she did roll the same effect. If you check in the PHB 
wild magic sorcerer the table's right there uh i might be uh, expanding if this is going to become a regular thing i have created a, a settled i think oh. on mechanic which is basically that once every adventure so i think 5e is very very stri um likes to pretend that it's not a game if you read the monster manual it's it, it treats them like it's a lore book, like someone wrote all this down. In fact, the books that you can buy are Volo's Guide, Mordenkainen's Tome. These are mm -hmm. books that are supposed mm -hmm. to be written by the fictional characters. It treats it like an in-world appendix, not like rules to a game, because that's what 4th edition did, and everyone hated it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that be So, um, uh, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think you had something about maybe it becoming like permanent. Uh, oh, 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 so um, anyway, 5th edition is really big on, it treats you in, it, it's like, it talks about days and weeks, hard time. I like to think of things more in terms of adventures. You saw that in the final skill challenge, where I told everyone, hey, this is over seven days, but really th think of this as an adventuring day. Because otherwise, uh, with seven days, Danny has like, what, like 28 uses <laughs> of... <laughs> flash of genius or something yep. crazy right. so i was like think of this as an adventuring day this week is so um once every adventuring day sort of the adventure uh if she would like danny can roll a d6 if she gets a six she will trigger a wild magic surge is how we're going to do it going mm -hmm. forward uh and i think that i might pull together a more sophisticated table because um uh there's only 50 options on there, and if this becomes a regular thing, she's going to exhaust them pretty quickly. And there are, like, a thousand different Wild Magic tables out there of varying quality yeah. and power. So we, we might expand it a little bit. But, yes, that's... So, yeah. Uh, I didn't fudge anything. She rolled 23 and 24. Those are both uh, turn blue on ridiculous. the uh, Wild Magic table, the which is completely ridiculous. The dice gods take it away. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't set out to create a character that would be infuriating for fan artists to deal with, but I do kind of <laughs> like that that's the art that Danny had this season was oh, entirely so metatextual, uh, just really annoying for everyone listening along at home. And I felt yeah. awful when we got, removed Curse I, and she wasn't. I, completely it forgot, either, I completely <laughs> forgot about we, that. Me too. It was the I, only I, way to get rid of the madness. And yeah, I no, it forgot was, that. It was 100% the only way, and I didn't even think about it at the time. But the minute it happened, I was like, oh, oh, no. Wait, the people yeah. are yeah, be so I, sad. I initially said that as a joke, like, ha, she's not blue anymore. And then it was like, wait, hold on. Yeah. Literally, yeah, yeah, I went back and I looked. Oh, my God, yeah. yeah. Someone had asked something about the madness. Um, I forget when, but someone had asked, like, why less restoration worked and the answer was that i was running a game and reading the rules for zook to madness and then reading the rules for madness in the there's uh, by the way a better word i hate calling it madness um there's a better mm -hmm. word for it out there but yeah. for these these you know these curses we'll call them uh reading the rules for these curses and they seemed to not line up with each other where it said that one is permanent until the spell and the other can't be dispelled so i basically rule and like these are the spells that'll work and they seem to contradict and I was running a game, so I basically ruled that I didn't want to punish the use of a resource. Uh, Finbar had a spell scroll, and so I de determined that the Lesser Restoration would work for a number of days. We had a roll for it, and then basically the curse would be inocu inoculated against that going forward. So Lesser Restoration essentially wouldn't work if you just cast it every couple days. It was a one and done, but I wanted to reward the use of a resource, especially when it's a one and done, like a spell scroll. Mm -hmm. um, you never just want to tell the player, hey, you fucked up. Mm -hmm. You get nothing for that. I mean, you know, if it seems if it seems to you like it's completely ridiculous and the player should understand, perhaps there's a scenario for that. But I want to reward it. I basically judge that uh, it should just be a temporary thing, and that's what happened. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm glad. And then uh, I like playing Lucky Bolt because it's basically just a button that I can push and see what happens. <laughs> and it, it, the narrative rewarded me for it, so I can't. I'm like, well, I can't stop now. Which? Um but we're, we're getting close to the end of the Q&A live stream. Uh, we have time for one more question from chat, and then we'll do some, some wrap-up. But uh, this question comes from Yuki Rashi. Uh, my current D&D &D group lost a full session when someone introduced Diggy Diggy Hole to the group. Has anything ever derailed <laughs> your groups in your sessions? Oh, God. Um, well, in Not this session one. 10 of Rolling with Difficulty Season 2, uh, Austin introduced a golden ram. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's yes. Right. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, I could not be happy. Absolutely about that. <laughs> fantastic. It was like the weirdest tangent that we had to go on. Oh, um, oh my god. Wild, yeah. I've been trying to use that stat block for it because there's the, the goat, when you have a goat put to the ram against 
it's the whole adventuring party. The Rand doesn't really threaten anyone's life. I don't think it does enough damage, but it's no. so annoying and hard to get down. down to uh, Brentley Mulligan. <laughs> yeah, yeah Brentley it was Mulligan extremely a, funny. It's a great quote talking about, um, if you haven't watched Escape from the Void Keep, uh, go watch it. Oh, it's amazing. Yes. The first yes. episode is a little much, but uh, it's amazing. But he talks about the Sam character being really, really hard to kill. And he describes it as in the old craft. Uh, Crash Bandicoot games that there was this chicken that was like impossible to kill or something because it didn't matter but it was infuriating that you could never kill it and so he does the same thing where he's like this NPC is actually completely irrelevant right Mm -hmm. Um, all they want to do is escape and they have nothing important going after them is completely a player choice so I'll just give them the stats of a storm giant and it'll just be this (laughs) fun bit Hamhead. That, exactly, Hamhead, thank you. So that's yep. basically where my mind was at, where it's like, they don't have to do this. So this thing is just really annoying to deal with, where it blinds you and it's impossible to hit yeah. and it can fly. I think the moment that really took me out was when you're like, oh, it has a fly speed. And then... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, like, you know that episode 10 was fucking crazy because the Golden Ram fight didn't even get that much attention in the comments. Because <laughs> I was uh. like... So good. After that, we were like, that's probably the funniest thing we've ever recorded. I, yeah. There's a few fights we've had that have been relatively low stakes, but have been really entertaining to listen back to. Uh, the omelet fight from episode one and the golden. Fantastic. Rose and Krantz and Guildenstern. Yes. Rose and Krantz and Guildenstern. Jesse James, you know, red and blue, whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah those, <laughs> those ones were fun. Um, but that's, I feel like the nature of a, an improvised TTRPG session is that you're going to go off the rails every once in a while. It's just a matter of being able to be aware of your group enough to know like if everyone's cool with that or not. Um, the home yeah. game that uh, Austin and I play in and Noir runs um, had a session that I think uh, I really, really epitomizes this idea. <laughs> we were in a, a dwarven Which city. Which one? <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's the uh, one. That's exactly oh, what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> We're in a dwarven oh, city. The so party is all staying in, in for the night. Um, and my bard and the party barbarian go on a simple mission to find out um, if <laughs> who sold a blacksmith <laughs> some ore yeah, no. or something oh, mundane no. like that. You think to yourself, oh, so you'll walk into the blacksmith. You'll say, hey, who sold you this? They'll tell you, and then you'll go back to the inn, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh, yeah. We ended up uh, breaking into and spending an entire session trying to go on a tour of and then later immediately escape the tour of Fantasy Amazon's factory in the Dwarven City. Uh, oh my God. It took up an entire session, and, <laughs> and I don't think I've ever really had that much fun playing d d Absolutely fantastic. Uh, but wow. Yeah, it's very easy it was, to uh, session. It was yeah. no good decisions <laughs> were made. Not one. But to this day, no Even Red's great Holds up. As an audience member that was so funny. I'll say for Wally and I, a uh, bag of we, Wally and I knew yeah, like, bag of characters with a bag of beans. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> where we were like, was, was that the end of we were playing Descent to Avernus? Was that the yes. end of the adventuring day where we'd done like eighteen encounters or something like that? Yeah, we had One just day. done a gauntlet done through El Torel. We made it to um like the high hall. We which was like that's that was the safest place in the city. And um, my character had a bag of beans and was bored and decided it, he wanted to go plant one of them yeah. outside. We were on watch or something, and we were like, yeah. "Today sucks. Let's let's have a little. Let's like blow up a little steam and like mess with this magic item." Oh no! And <laughs> yeah, no. Go ahead. It summoned. Oh my god! It summoned. I think like twelve intellect devourers and what? some other big monster. Yeah. How? Why did uh, it do it's that? A, it's a random chart. It's a random yep. chart you roll on, like wild magic and. Uh, one of the things it can do if you roll a 100 is it grows a beanstalk to another plane of existence. That's we cool. Did, the first, the, yeah, the first time we used it was we summoned a bunch of monsters. Oh no, the first time we used it, we got the statue of your character that uh, yes. that revealed our position. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. It, it's a statue of your character that yells at you and berates you and reveals yes. our, our stealth position. <laughs> uh, it, there was a lot, and uh, I mean, what happened uh, when we got to the high hall? Uh, essentially. The intellect of ours uh, turns out uh, something about them like being an illusion, but like we couldn't figure it out. Um, and uh, I ended up in a ditch somehow. And uh, everyone was just like, you're going to stay in that ditch because you're a danger to everyone with that bag of beans. Um, and it was like a solid like hour of the session of just saying, hey, Wally, you got to be careful with those bag of beans. Um, at the end of the day, it kind of worked out. Um, uh, towards the end of the session, uh, I had planted another bean and um, a pyramid um with a mummy lord 
uh, oh my God. Yeah, the- sprung up in the center of the city. Oh um, we were getting and, ready for the fine, like the second to like the, yeah. the assault against the lieutenants of the bad guy, and we were like, we could use a distraction. Plant that bean that summoned a bunch of monsters, uh, and it summoned, a, bean. A, uh, it summoned yeah. a pyramid with a mummy lord, and the sand blinded us all. <laughs> oh man! So basically, uh, uh, it worked out. Who it gave you out. those beans? Random magic item we found somewhere, I think. Yep. Oh my God. Yeah. Do you it think was in a dungeon or something. You know, it's it's both. It's at its best when it gets completely derailed, and also. So it's the kind of thing we're like, oh, you couldn't script comedy like this. Um, no, of you course really not. Because yeah. you can't really script any of it. That's the magic of a collaborative tabletop role-playing game. Uh, this has been the season two postseason Q&A for Rolling with Difficulty. Thank you guys so, so much for listening this season. Um, yeah. It's been a blast. Yeah. If you didn't get your question answered and you're desperate for one uh, to hear what we have to say, you can email us at rollwithdifficulty at gmail.com. And by the end of the week, we'll get through all of the questions we received there. So feel free to shoot us uh, a question that way if yeah. you didn't hear yours answered in this episode. Um uh, also, thanks. if it's like a really good discussion, like we do have the Reddit um, that you yeah. can come to. Yeah. So, you know, if it's something yeah, that's it's a little, you know, of a little more personal, but. The, there's a subreddit and a TV Tropes page that the fans have made. Uh, thank you guys so, so much for that. It's very cool to see. Um, and if yes. you want more Rolling with Difficulty content uh, and you don't want to wait for us to get our stuff together, then definitely go check those out. Um, we have some bonus content coming at you before season three, which will be coming out in January. Yes. Uh, this October in particular on Halloween night, you may want to check your <laughs> podcast feeds uh, for a little update. But uh, so in the excited. meantime, uh, stay tuned for, you know, extra updates and things on our Twitter and on the community page on YouTube. And uh, thank you guys so, so much for listening. It's been a blast making the show and a blast making this season. And I can't wait for the emotional damage that Noir is about to inflict on us in season three. <laughs> Me too. I'm so excited. <laughs> Bring it. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.